Okay, good morning everybody. Um, and if I could just ask members on uh, Starleaf to mute their tablets when they're, when they're not talking. Um, welcome to the 50th meeting of the Economy Committee. Some members will be attending this morning's uh, meeting via video conference and our witnesses this morning will be briefing us via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. Um, I'd just like to welcome to the committee um, Paul Gibbon, who has replaced um, Gary Middleton, who has become a junior minister, and I would just like to put on record our thanks to Gary for his um, service to the committee, um, and welcome, Paul. So, moving on to apologies, we have no apologies, and I think everybody is already here. So, item number two, then, draft minutes. There's a copy of the minutes um, from the meeting held on the 3rd of February at page five of your pack. Um, are members content that these are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so moving on then to item number three, um, Chair's business. There, at page four of the table paper, there is correspondence from the Speaker, Alex Maskey, MLA, highlighting a public petition regarding broadband in the Sparrows, which was laid in the Assembly on the 8th of February by Declan McAleer. The Speaker has written to the Economy Minister to inform her that a public petition has been presented on this matter. The official report records the laying of the petition and it can be viewed on the Assembly website. So um, I'm sure all members will support the petition in relation to broadband. Um, unless members have any comments, it's for noting. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on then. Um, item number 3.2 isn't in your packs, but the clerk has been liaising with his counterparts in the ERA and Infrastructure Committees regarding a briefing from TSS and HMRC in relation to issues that have arisen with the implementation of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the Protocol. Um, contact has been made with TSS and HMRC regarding a briefing by the ERA clerk. So the, Peter might want to speak to this. Um, so I could have just asked anybody who's not muted to, to mute themselves. We're getting a wee bit of feedback. Peter, do you want to speak to this? Chair, yeah, we, we've had a discussion and the economy remit is, is probably at the most strategic level. So the agreement between the three clerks was that we would look to take the briefing forward and because our cells and infrastructure on a Wednesday, we'd look to have it on a Wednesday morning. Um, ERA have agreed to that. So basically what we'll do now is go ahead, find a suitable date, um, flag that into um, forward work programmes and look at the issues we want to discuss. Obviously, a three-committee meeting will be um, fairly epic in size, so we, we have to think of a few ways to just make that a bit more manageable, and we'll bring back that uh, to committee for approval. Okay, thanks, Peter. So, our members agree the committee takes forward the lead in organising the briefing for the three committees, and also that we write to the ERA and infrastructure committees to seek their agreement to form a joint committee under standing orders to receive a briefing. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, then we're moving on to um, our departmental briefing on the draft budget 2021-22. There is an updated <laughs> clerk's memo at page six of table papers, a statement from the Minister for Finance on the draft budget at page 16 of your pack, a copy of the draft budget at page 26, and a briefing slideshow at page 10 of table papers. And can I ask um, to bring the officials into the spotlight, please? Um, Mike Brennan, Permanent Secretary of the Economy Department, Sharon Hetherington, who is the Director of Finance, and David Malcolm, who is Management Service and Regulation Group. So, Mike, if I hand over to yourself, if you can hear us okay, and um, if I invite you to make an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to, to members. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm just checking that you can hear me okay. Yep, yeah, we can. And, and then, yeah, I can see my two colleagues on, on the line as well. That's great, thanks. Okay, Chair, I'll just make a few opening comments um, and then we can get into um, the budget details um, and Sharon and David have some slides that will give some structure to, to that discussion, hopefully. Um, just to give you some insight into the scale of the challenge that lies ahead for DFA as a department in 21-22, um, I think it's useful just to take stock of where the local economy is at this point in time. Um, so some of the key economic metrics to consider are we know that the unemployment claimant count has doubled in, in less than a year. We know that the employment rate has fallen down to 70.6. The inactivity rate has increased to 27%. Um, and we know in terms of overall economic activity, you know, if you look at the economic composite index, the local economy um, is still 8.3% below 
where it was in quarter two, 2007. You know, so there, it's a pretty grim picture out there. And when you look ahead, you have to bear in mind that we have, as at the end of December, like it's 90, 95,000 workers still furloughed and another 52,000 who regard themselves as self-employed on income support from uh, HMRC and Treasury. So there's basically 150,000 employees and self-employed um, reliant on, on income support. Um, and you just have to wonder what the impact on the local labour market will be as we move forward into 21-22. Um, so that, that gives you a sense of where the economy is and the challenges that lie ahead for DFA as a department, particularly in terms of skills interventions. So to turning to the, the, the draft budget allocation for the department for 21-22, you know, at first glance, um, and, and you hear people saying, oh, it's a flat cash settlement. So it's really just a continuation of where you were in the year before. But that masks a multitude of worries that Sharon and, and David will take us through shortly in their presentation. Um, so uh, my, my starting position is to bear in mind that when you think about flat cash um, for the department, um, you also must bear in mind the wide range of inescapable pressures that have to be addressed. They can't be put aside, they can't be deferred or postponed. In addition to that, the department is also grappling and will continue to grapple for, I suspect, all of 21-22, the outworkings of, of COVID um, and the health restrictions, and also um, the settling down in terms of where we are in the EU exit and the protocol. Overarching all of that as a department, one of the big worries I have is that how we as a department are resourced to deliver that. And as, as the committee will know, we're currently carrying vacant staff vacancy rate somewhere in the order of 25%. So we're, we're a significantly depleted department in terms of staff, and yet we have a significant um, challenge lying ahead in terms of maintaining our routine business and then also addressing COVID and Brexit. So I say, Chair, that, that's a very, very quick counter through in terms of where I think the economy is and the challenge it poses for the departments. If you're content, I'll maybe ask Sharon and David then to launch straight into the slide back. Yep, thank you, Mike. Okay, thanks, Chair. Sharon, David? Yes, um, okay, well, I'll uh, take you through the slide back, Chair, if that's okay. Um, so uh, we have a, a set of slides there for you, I suppose, to give you a bit of a flavour and an overview um, of what the budget settlement looks like for DFE. I think Mike has given you a very good contextual uh, sense there in his opening statement. Um, I think I'd refer you first, um, if we go to slide three, and you know the point that Mike was making there about um, a, a flat cash settlement. Um, I suppose slide three tries to set that out. Um, I think sort of within the um, budget document that's out for consultation, um, you know, it may look like there is a 2% increase um, in the DFE baseline, but actually whenever you get underneath um, sort of our, our figures, which we've tried to set out in those slides, you can see there the baseline for for the, the year we're in was 805 and going forward to next year it is 805 as well though you know we have got funding for a number of other things and they're set out there which total 15.8 million bringing our baseline up to the 821 um, but the, the, those the, the funding that we have been given are for specific areas so you know it's it's not available to use um freely to allocate across the department um it is also worth noting and it's on the bottom of the slide there that there's 12.2 million that we have secured for the operation of the northern ireland protocol but of course that is for um, additional work that needs to be carried out in the context of the protocol um, as a department, I think it's worth saying in terms of the protocol, we were quite successful in our negotiations with Treasury through the Department of Finance um, and we got almost all of the costs that we had bid for for the protocol for next year. Um, if I move on then to the next slide, it sort of tries to depict um, graphically for you really where the areas of spend within the department are. Um, and you can see there that around 670 million or about 76% um, is committed to education 
and that's through universities, further education colleges or vital skills and apprenticeship initiatives. Um, there's 132 million to economic and business development and then we move on to smaller amounts for tourism and then also in terms of representation and regulatory services. Um, the next slide then sort of just sets out the actual numbers that have gone in to make up, up the, the pie chart in the previous slide. Um, if we move on then to the next slide, so it's really setting out the challenges for 2021-22. So you can see there that um, the, the flat resource settlement results in DfE actually having to find just short of 18 million internally um, to address inescapable pressures. Um, and the inescapable pressures are, are set out in the next slide. But, you know, essentially they relate to around 8.5 million from historic um, pay and price inflation that's not in the baseline. There's also, we estimate, a further 2.3 million for pay and price pressures for next year. Um, we also have, um, and the committee will be familiar with this through monitoring rounds um, in previous um, sessions. Um, so there is a, a, a baseline deficit within further education of over five million pounds. And then of course we have um, a public service obligation for the city of Derry Airport. Um, and uh, you know, that's not in the baseline either. So in addition to that, DFE is faced with 30, 31.7 million pressures relating to year two from COVID initiatives. So whenever um, the department proposed initiatives last year, um, you'll, you'll remember that there were a number of them where we were saying there would be COVID tails. Um, and they are totaling around 37.5 million. I mean, the main part of that relates to apprenticeship and skills. There's also over 6 million, um, which relates to the decision to raise the Mazen cap in higher education. And there's around 5 million in terms of business support initiatives. I think one of the things, and uh, you know, I refer to it on the slide there, um, is the uncertainty around EU replacement funding. So at the minute, there, there is nothing confirmed around the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, but the committee will be aware that we took action in the January monitoring and secured, um, you know, over, I think it's about 40, maybe 45 million um, of um, funding for ESF and ERDF, which hopefully buys us some time uh, until we can understand what the EU replacement funding and what the system for that looks like and orientate ourselves um, to, towards trying to secure um, some of that funding. Um, obviously, and Mike has referred to it, um, it, you know, there is a need to focus on rebuilding the economy. Um, so that is a massive challenge for this department for the next financial year because there's no funding in the baseline um, to look at how we support our economy uh, and also link to that, you know, how we develop skills and support the development of those skills, helping our economy um, going forward. Um, as, as I said earlier, the next slide just sets out um, those inescapable pressures um, for, for the committee so that um, you can see where the 17.8 million comes from and equally the next slide um, gives you more detail on the 31.7 um, million of the inescapable COVID pressures that I was referring to. Um, as I said, you know, one of one of the big challenges is sort of how, how we reorientate the economy back to something that might seem like normal and the job that we need to go on um, within Northern Ireland to deliver that. So looking to that, um, the next slide um, refers to the High Street Support Scheme and also the Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme. Um, and you know, we're seeing those within the department, why they're important um, to us is that they are to demand stimuli initiatives um, for the economy. And, um, you know, we have proposed that they will be taken forward next year 
funding isn't secured for them yet. Um, I suppose that's that's a decision for the executive. Um, but you know that's why we see them as important for the economy because they're demand stimuli. And if I move on then to the next slide, and you know it sort of deals a bit more with economic recovery. Um, in terms of bidding for the next financial year, um, the, the department did bid for 167 million, um, put forward bids to that, that extent. Um, it, you know, the economic impact of COVID-19 is unprecedented. Um, and also EU exit does add a further dimension to that. So, you know, huge economic impacts that might normally take months or years to unfold uh, and occurred within weeks of um, lockdown and sort of industry shutdowns. Um, so that was the, the background towards the bids of 167 million. It is to try and focus, to, to move out of survival mode, to, have, to, to try and have the, you know, sort of the forward site for next year to think about moving out of survival mode and then, you know, the department has been working on a plan to deliver economic recovery and set out how we would do that. So, you know, that's the, the, the funding um, bids. That's what they're underpinning. Um, we do, DFE absolutely recognises that more needs to be done to respond to this um, health and economic crisis. And, you know... We had bid for the 167 million um, refers to 50 million that we had bid for for a COVID economic recovery fund and then another 50 million for a skills recovery fund. Um, so, you know, that slide kind of sets out there the additional areas that we think uh, um, in taking the economy forward, the additional areas that um, we feel that we need to focus on, that our economic recovery plan is being built around. Um, and, and really the things that we think will make you know, a positive difference to the Northern Ireland economy. Um, so the next slide then, um, if we move on there, um, sort of gives you a bit of background about the economic recovery plan that um, we are seeking to develop. It's built around four pillars, um, supporting innovation, highly skilled and agile workforce, supporting investment trade and exports and supporting a greener economy. Um, of course, all those pillars are absolutely intertwined and cross-cutting and will support the rebuilding framework you know that we are seeking to deliver better jobs address regional imbalance you know looking at people and well-being and also resilience um so you know that's why it really is important that the department would secure funding um to support that plan and the delivery of it um if i move on then to the next slide it's really seeking to set out the importance of economic recovery supported through skills. So there's a need for investment in skills and it's been absolutely mag magnified since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, those individuals impacted through redundancies and furlough um, more likely um, to be in those sectors with a high concentration of lower qualified workers. So it's important that within our strategy, you know, we have we have things there to address that. Um, you know, if you look at things that like low productivity, this, you know, Northern Ireland has a disproportionate number in the workforce with low skills or no skills and a higher portion of economically inactive um, people. So you know, we need to be mindful of all that and our skills recovery plan needs to understand the context of that and acknowledge it and build on it. Um, obviously, um, the claimant count at de December 20 stood um, over 58,000. There's also, as we know, a significant number of workers still on furlough. Um, you know, notifications of redundancy have been at their highest level for 10 years. So that's all building up a picture here where we know there's going to be, you know, a number, a further number. Oh. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost, lost Sharon, Sharon, Sharon. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think we have lost Sharon. Um, so I'm happy to just pick up from where Sharon left off, just to finish off. If, okay. Thanks. If you want, uh, so what Charm was talking about is the need to, uh, we have, you know, the, the, the claimant count has doubled uh, in the last year. Uh, forecasts indicate uh, that actually it will rise at the moment, it's just over 60,000. Uh, different forecasts are predicting that will once further wins and, and we know uh, that there, there are still approximately 150,000 people on furlough, of, uh, either self-employed or, or the normal furlough scheme. So we're expecting that to top out at maybe 100,000. You know, we have long-term unemployed already uh, at 31 percent. Youth unemployment is at 9.6 percent. So, so we know that if uh, we're going to we're going to improve those for people, then we need to we need to put funding through a skills academy that will actually start to look at uh, you know. Lifelong learning, uh, and it will actually start to address some of the uh, problems that we've had in skills. We we need to put as as much a focus on our over 50s as our 18 to 24 category, because people the the, the category of people that are losing jobs, uh, they will need retrained for for new new industries, uh, for new uh, opportunities that are coming forward, and that's where we believe we need to invest in skills and and apprenticeships, open bring back open age apprenticeships that will uh, create the opportunities for people to be reskilled up. Uh, uh, to to help the economic recovery. So it is. Uh, Sharon was going to end on a, a slightly more positive note. Uh, if we move to slide uh, page 13, our capital draft allocations. So unlike our resourcing position, uh, our capital position is a much more positive one. Over 70% of our bids have been met, uh, and this will allow us to meet all our contractual commitments, uh, and therefore about 69-70% of our high-priority projects uh, that are submitted uh, as part of our, our bidding process, and all of our uh, FTC bids that we, we put out uh, uh, will also be met, so they will or not. Uh, so we, we are we are quite optimistic uh, in, in terms of the capital side, if not on the resource side. Uh, we have to say that uh, funding for uh, new decade, new approach, uh, city deals, that, that is still to be confirmed, so it is, so that's not yet been allocated. Uh, however, there are discussions ongoing, the finance minister and the executive uh, are, are uh, discussing how those allocations will be made, uh, but we're not in a position at this stage to, to announce that we have received any funding specifically for any of those. And that's that's where we would uh, bring this quick counter to an end, and, and I'm, I'm fairly confident you will have uh, plenty more questions now for us as Sharon, as Sharon comes back, perfectly timed to answer them. <laughs> Thanks, David. Chair, so that is, as David says, a very quick counter through the budget position. The one um, point I would draw attention members' attention to is the penultimate slide and the point Sharon was making. You know, investment in skills is 14% in real terms, lower than it was a decade ago. And when you look at the challenges that lie ahead in the labour market over the next year and the years thereafter, um, it's going to be a very difficult environment. Okay. Um, thank you all three of you for the, the briefing. It has been, I suppose, a very useful um, overlay of, of where we, we currently are. And, and as you said, the committee is obviously very aware of the challenges that we're facing um, currently and, and the likelihood that that's going to continue for some time and, and potentially worsen, as, as has been alluded to, when um, furlough ends and when other support schemes end. So and I guess, obviously, the significant challenge of having a flat line budget in that context, and I suppose you know it's the difficulty with the, the move away from the, the promise of multi-year um, budgets in, in, in November. And, and, and I suppose the non-funding of some of the NDNA commitments from last year, so it, it is a very challenging picture, and, and we are very aware of that. And obviously, even over the past year, while significant funding did come in to support um, COVID supports, you know, it came in dribs and drabs, and that has made it really difficult to be able to, to plan things. And if that continues, it's going to, to continue to put that challenge in, in relation to being able to plan interventions. So I guess that, that just is a very difficult context, and, and we recognise that. Um, can I just ask a, a few things, just to pick up on the, the final point around skills, um, and you have outlined, you know, and I think the committee would, would be supportive of the fact that we do need investment in skills, and in relation to the new strategy and, and plans and programmes that might be being put in place, in relation to skills intervention, how, has, how developed are those, um, what are the proposals around that, and has that been bid for in terms of this budget, or is that something that you will be seeking to um, secure further funding for? 
Okay, thanks, Chair. Well, well, as you know, the department has for some time now been working up its um, its skills strategy, um, and that uh, ideally will set out proposed policy interventions in a range of areas from level level zero right up to level seven. Um, and there are some areas that we as a department think deserve prioritisation, for example, in apprenticeships um, and dealing with level zero and level one. Um, the, the challenge we face is um, trying to progress the skills strategy while we're grappling with um, COVID-19. And that, I say that for two reasons, two difficulties that have to be addressed. The practical difficulties of, of um, staffing and getting resources to move ahead with the skills strategy when, our, our, as I say, our staffing resources are spread so thinly, um, this has meant that we've had to divert resources away from delivery of key st strategies, not just the skills strategy, other strategies within the department, like the energy strategy, have suffered as a consequence of that. Um, but then also we have to factor in the fact that, you know, the COVID-19 is going to have such a profound impact on the local labour market, not just for 21-22, but for the years thereafter. So that will require some revisions as to where we think the skills strategy needs to go. But you know, it, it is well advanced, um, and we need, to, as I say, now to re to revisit it um, in light of COVID nineteen and where we think um, the executive will want to go in terms of a, a, an economic pathway out of COVID nineteen into a longer term economic vision. Okay, um, thanks for that, Mike. And you referred specifically there to apprenticeships and. Obviously, there was um, bids made and allocated in relation to the apprenticeship recovery and retention programmes, uh, and you know, obviously, there were some difficulties, as you say, practically in terms of, um, you know, with additional restrictions being put in place. Is that something that you intend to bid for again in in the new financial year? Yeah, I'll maybe bring Sharon or David in to go into the detail, but obviously, some of the um, the recovery apprenticeship recovery packages that we did put in place and um, they have significant financial tails that go into the 21-22 year so in terms of the budget we need to find you know, the resources to honour them as Sharon set out in her slides but I think it, it, it's a certainty that we need to have further apprenticeship interventions starting in the new year 21-22 and um, all around you know about the three dimensions of this in terms of um, returning apprenticeships, retaining apprenticeships, and actually getting results from apprenticeships. And um, so, you know, the way I look at it, apprenticeships in the context of COVID is um, what we have in place isn't the sum, that's not the end of it. I think we will need new interventions in 21 22 year in, in apprenticeships. Um, and so, whether that means a massive expansion, for example, in the challenge fund, um, I think that's undoubtedly where we'll have to go. Sharon, do you want to maybe say something about the funding of apprenticeships? legacy tales and where we might go in 2122? Um, yes, um, well, as I highlighted um, there in the slides, um, you know, we, we have estimated that the, the tales from the initiatives that we started in um, the current year, um, that will require 18 and a half million um, to be bid for. Um, we would obviously um, be bidding for that from COVID funds as they become available to the executive. Um, and obviously, the sooner we can get certainty, um, you know, that um, we have that funding, um, the better. Um, but we did, you know, we, d we were quite clear with the executive whenever we were setting up the initiatives that it was absolutely the right thing to do this year um, because we did need to support apprenticeships whenever we were bidding for that money. But the consequence was that there, there would be those um, financial tails. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just go back then to um, an, another point you referred to in your presentation around the 12 million that has been um, secured for the operation of the protocol? So, can you just talk me through that a, a bit in relation to? Did you say that that money has come from Treasury? Um, so, sorry, you broke up a little there. Are you asking about the protocol? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Sure. Um, yes, so um, the all Northern Ireland departments um, had to submit very, very detailed bids um, to the Department of Finance, who obviously reviewed that, and then they would negotiate with Treasury on our behalf. Um, so DFE was very successful um, in 
the work that it had done, I propose to convince Treasury that we did need the extra funding um, for the money. So I think in total, um, we had bid for about 12.5 million and we got the 12.2 million. So, you know, we, we were very pleased that we had done, done a good job and got, got, got a good outcome there, um, you know, to us with, with that work. Sean, can I just ask what what specifically is that funding um, for? Um, that funding, I mean, you know, sort of a, a policy area could give you much more detail than me. Um, but that funding is for um, a number of posts within the department um, and initiatives to support support business and. Um, you know, sort of as as we seek to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol and the outworkings of it for Northern Ireland. Okay, so if I can just go then to the breakdown um, of the non-ring fenced resource. So the economic and business development is 132 million, and Intertrade Ireland um, is 3 million, and both of those um, have significant reductions from the previous year. So I think it was 142 million for business development last year. And intertrades was four million, so that's a quarter of a cut to intertrades budget this um, financial year. And just given the significance of the work that they do cross border and helping businesses um, to develop, and you know, like there was a manufacturing NI um, survey this week that showed 25% of businesses have reorientated supply chains locally or into the, the EU. So that obviously is. Uh, an area of work that is significantly important in the current context in relation to you know both implementing the protocol and the the new um, difficulties being faced in, in response to brexit so it just could i suppose what is the justification for um, the reduction in those two um, budget areas okay um, well what we're setting out there is the baseline allocation um, and actually, there is no reduction in the baseline allocation um, from previous years. But the difference between the baseline and the budget that, say, Intertrade would have got last year is as a result of additional funding, um, you know, for a number of different pots that they can bid to. Um, so if I look at Intertrade, um, I can see that the baseline there is 3 million. It was 3 million last year. Um, but what Intertrade accessed last year um, was EU exit funding. Um, they also had some in-year additional funding. They had additional COVID funding and they had Northern Ireland Protocol funding of, I think it was 130,000. Um, so, so the baseline um, in all those areas is just the same as it was in the current year. And that's that's you know sort of we have had no change to our baseline at a top level and we have made no change certainly as it sits um to our baselines throughout the um various bodies that we fund and um, but it, it is really as a result of additional funding that comes available and obviously all the organizations included will be able to bid for um, funding, you know, sort of as, as parts become available during the year. Okay, so I was looking at the um, budget that was published in, in May last year, the budget document, and, and it ha has those figures in relation to, to both Intertrade and, and the economic and business development, and all the other budget lines, as you have indicated, are, are the same. It's just those two that are different. So are you telling me that those two reflected additional money that had been directed in relation to other um, funding streams? Have we lost Sharon again? Oops. I think we've lost Sharon again, yeah, Chair. I think so. Um, so, Chair, I, I can come in. Certainly, Intertrade Space Line for the last three years has been 2.9 million. So it has, and, and it, it will be exactly the same this year. So what they did last year was they bid into, as Sharon said, for additional funding. Actually, they got it from quite a few pots. Uh, there was EU exit funding, in-year funding, COVID funding, and that brought them up to a total budget last year of 5.2 uh, million. So they will start this year again exactly as they started last year in their baseline, but they will then have access to bid in uh, just as when money becomes available and what sort of work they're doing that they can actually tap into uh, 
if there's additional funding or EU exit money is required. So, so their position hasn't changed from where they started last year. Where it ends uh, from, from this year and the next year will depend on what happens with them next year. Okay, no, look, thanks for that. Um, I, and I, I suppose in that context, do every year they get additional money allocated? Because in 2018-19, the art turn was 4.35 million. And then um, last year, according to the main estimates in October, it was 4.65 million was their provision. So is that a, a consistent thing that they would have additional money allocated throughout the year? Yeah, so from 2018-19, their baseline has been flat at 2931. Uh, however, they've had significant EU exit funding from that year. So they have, which has boosted their end year position, just exactly as you say. So I, 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 I can quite happily send you a table, Chair, if it would help, just to, to outline the, the last five years of their funding and the mixture of where it's come from. But what you will see is the baseline has, has been uh, constant uh, and their ability to bid in for other funding during the year has been what's boosted of their end year total. Okay, David, that would be really useful. And I suppose it would just emphasize that the point, you know, around the importance of, of that work to support businesses to be able to take advantage of any protections that the protocol do, does offer. Um, so I'm just going to bring in some other members now to ask some questions. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your presentation, um, Mike, and thank you for the context um, for getting there. Obviously, there is many things to be worried about at the moment, um, and, and I suppose we one of the main things that we all have to do is plan for the future uh, and be optimistic about that future um, in, in many ways, because uh, if we weren't, uh, <laughs> we would all be um, very much down in our... Uh, very much feeling very down at, at the moment, but I, I'm concerned. There's a, there's some other multiple concerns. Also, I'm concerned first of all uh, what Mike said about his own department. The fact that there is such high level of staff vacancy. Um, I mean, this is a time when we may need the Department for Economy to be really well resourced uh, and well staffed. Can, can he give me any insight as to why there is such a high level of staff vacancy within the department? And the other thing that I would say, does that impact on maybe some of the grants not getting out as quickly as um, we would like them to get out because of the lack of, of, of staff within the department or, or just a workload that, that uh, is very difficult to, to undertake? Okay, um, thanks for that question. Um, the two issues are actually uh, very directly related to each other. So as you say, the department is sitting with a vacancy rate of 25% at the minute, and other NI departments are sitting with vacancies as well. Um, I think across the civil service, there's something like 4,500 vacancies out of a workforce of 23,000. So you can see um, DFE as a department is not unique, but the picture is probably most acute in DFE as a department. One of the reasons why the vacancy rate is so high is that um, we obviously have to rely on corporate recruitment competitions across NICF largely, um, and they have been constrained significantly over the last year. Um, so uh, the NICS, HR process, and HR Connect have um, been constrained because of COVID, not been able to have assessment centres and, and issues like that. And that's hit particularly at grades like EO1, EO2, staff officer and DP, um, which are probably the most important in terms of being the bedrocks of high departments. So that DFA, as I say, is probably most acutely exposed um, at carrying that vacancy rate. Um, and that has then, going on to your, your second point, Sinead, in terms of the problems within the department and, and grants. So your staff numbers are down 25%. And then all of a sudden you find yourself having to engage in COVID recovery exercises, spend six or seven hundred million pounds on grant assistance, you didn't actually envisage doing. Um, at the same time, when expectations, political expectations are that the other parts of the department, the routine functions that the department has set out in the business plan should continue as normal. So, and, and I'll be quite open about this, the, the staff in the department are under significant pressure. Um, they're covering for the vacancies, 
they're now having to deliver at pace grant schemes that they didn't really have any expertise at all in doing. There was no business plan set out to give a structure to how they're going to be doing. I think what has been achieved over the last year in terms of getting out that degree of spend across a wide range of sectors is, 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 a, is actually quite a, a marvellous achievement. And it's generated quite a significant amount of frustration because on the one hand, we have found ways to get schemes up and running and get payments made to the various hard pressed sectors. And yet, you know, almost at the same time, officials are getting hammered because, oh, you know, so-and-so got two payments in two different schemes, one in the Department of Finance and one in the Department of Economy. So basically, there's a perception that they can't win. They're under pressure to get the money out as quickly as possible. And, you know, that's the whole reason for asking for ministerial directions, because there was always a recognition that there would be some degree of error. But the minute an error is, is identified, officials get hammered. I, 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 as a county officer for the department, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm particularly worried about where the department officials are at this point in time. Um, they're under significant press pressure. Indeed, we had one, one senior official last night, uh, an emergency admission to hospital last night, um, because of the consequences of the pressure of work and delivering one of the schemes last week. And that's not unique. That's been happening. I, there, I can give you other instances of that, where staff are under significant pressure to deliver, because the public and political expectation is there. Um, but there needs to be a recognition that these guys are doing their best um, to do this as quickly, as professionally as possible. The, the vacancy rate is not helping, I'll admit that. Uh, and I mean, you have you have a, a duty of care, obviously, um, Mike, yep. to all your staff. Uh, uh, and um, I, I mean, I'm concerned when you tell when you tell me that as well, because uh, as the committee for the economy, we have a duty of care um, to the staff as well. I believe that we do. Um, and, and I know that many people, and I get emails on a Sunday evening about grants from officials as well. So, I mean, they're working over and above uh, their time. And, and I realise that there is a lot of pressure on the public. And we as public representatives are also putting a lot of pressure on the department as well. And I accept that. Um, but, but it is uh, right across society that the stress levels are so high because people are wondering, you know, how they are going to put food on the table, how they are going to, you know, make ends meet as well. So it's really, really uh, stressful right around. And I hope uh, to goodness that the official that had to uh, go into hospital is OK. And um, I mean, it's just it's. A stressful situation all around, as I say, and we need to find a little bit of hope at the end of it. And uh, you know, and I'm wondering, is there any other additional support that you could be given that will help support your department? Are there other departments that are under or over resourced that you know staff could move um, to where the need is most required at this particular time? You know, um, uh, and even is there anything even in our, our, our you know our council areas where staff are under um, uh, underemployed at this particular time that they could move in uh, to central government? You know, is there solutions out there that we need to find in order to take the pressure off those that are really really having to work way above and beyond and still and still not getting the job done? And that's you know it's like the inbox that never empties. Um, once you, you think you've got something done, something else comes crashing along uh, and makes the job even more difficult. So is, is there any solutions that you have identified that we could uh, collectively work together to, to resolve them? Um, it's obviously an issue that's been discussed um, between permanent secretaries and indeed uh, I raised it with the head of the civil service recently. Um, as I say, all departments are carrying vacancies. Um, but DFE, and I would also say Department of Health and Department for Communities are at the real sharp edge of this in terms of um, addressing COVID-19. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I will continue to raise the issue and, you know, th there must be some scope to divert resources from the less pressurised departments towards health communities and, and the economy. Uh, that, that just has to be done. The, the, the worry I have is when you look ahead to what 21-23 holds, I can see, I think it's probably inevitable that we're going to have further raft of either new grant schemes or existing grants, grant schemes extended. 
Um, so that again, as I said earlier, poses two problems. How do you resource that and deliver that to public expectations? And what does it mean for the, I would call, the routine work program that the department is expected to deliver in 21-22? But no, rest assured, I, I will continue to raise it with, with the head of the civil service and indeed uh, uh, discussions with the minister later today on this point. And, and just in relation to the budget and the presentation um, from Sharon there, uh, there's a couple of things. I was going to ask about the protocol, just details, but uh, the chair has already dealt with that, so I'll just leave it. Uh, and she's also uh, dealt with Intertrade Ireland. I just see that, you know, these areas are areas of opportunity for us uh, as well. You know, we're in a very unique position in and around the protocol. I think we need to uh, manage those opportunities. So therefore, investment within um, Intertrade Ireland within um, Invest and I are really, really important now uh, because we have to grasp uh, whatever competitive age that we have. And, I, you know, I'd like to speak to you probably, Mike, in much more detail about how we actually drive those opportunities. And I have seen, you know, uh, Kevin Holland, um, there were two articles in the Bell Tell um, last week about, you know, um, more, more inquiries. Um, uh, regarding the Northern Ireland marketplace, and that's really good news, and we have to grasp the, 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 the pieces of good news that we have. But the, the other aspect that I want probably just a little more detail, and I know this is um, the unfunded and, um, pressures about uh, the higher education and that 5% phased uh, increase um, of the MASM. Um, so that's unfunded, so you're trying to find money for that. But is that not imperative if we're looking at our skills strategy and, and we're looking at the at our whole education strategy right through um, from, from, from um, our, our 14 to 19 strategy and right through on to our higher education? We've got to have uh, more investment in our people and our, we have to stop the brain drain. And that's the way to do it. So, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it is one of the inescapables. Uh, and how do you see, can I ask any more detail in and around that 5% uh, phased increase? And is that year on year? You know, are we thinking of that going forward into the next, say, five years each year? Oh, oh, okay, I, you know, I'll, I'll bring Sharon and David in in a second. What I would say is that um, the the Mazen cost, the additional cost incurred, were a direct consequence of COVID um, and the impact it had on the universities last summer. Um, it would be my expectation, therefore, that the request funding for 21-22, again, is a direct COVID uh, cost. And I would have a high expectation that they would be covered as part of the COVID bid the department will put into the executive in the coming weeks. Um, Sharon, David, do you, do you want to maybe come in on that? Um, Mike, there's nothing much more to add. I think the, you know would agree with what you've said there. We would have a high expectation that those costs would be met. Um, I think Sinead, you know, you sort of talked about um, investing in our people and sort of does this go on for you know sort of a number of years? Um, and I think that's that's the difficulty with running one year budgets. But I suppose we are where we are um, in terms of you know the UK government's decision to have a one year spending review. But yes, you know, I don't think that that increase, um, you know, that, that that's not going to go away because obviously, if you take students in um, on the first year of their degree, they need to finish their degree. Um, you know, so we would be looking at that cost for a number of years. I would expect. Okay, I, I have a number of other questions as well regarding uh, the COVID grants, but I'm going to let it go and see how uh, everybody else gets on with the question. There's a multitude of questions that we could all ask, to be honest. Thanks, Sinead. Um, and, and Mike, just before I move on to the, the next um, member, I just want to, on behalf of the committee, offer our, our best wishes to your staff member for a speedy recovery. And, and last week, when um, Paul was in briefing the, the committee about business supports, a number of members reflected their appreciation to the efforts that staff are putting mm. in and I just want to reflect that to yourself yeah. also because we do know there is significant pressure in relation to that. Thank you, Chair. And say, you know, many in the department will be watching this session, obviously, but it isn't one individual. We've lost other individuals and I'm particularly worried about a few um, who are on the ragged edge, so your comments are much appreciated. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Claire, please? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I, I want to come back to your, your comments in relation to rebuilding the economy and skills, um, and I entirely agree that one almost follows the other. Um, I suppose in, in light of the pandemic and almost as a consequence of the pandemic, um, are you finding yourselves having to review what skills will now be required in Northern Ireland, and how do we respond to that as quickly as we need to be? And in, 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 in trying to rebuild the the economy, um, I, I, I do notice that some of the the apprenticeships that you're, you're offering recently seem to be more digital based uh, apprenticeships, which you know I, I think that's wrong. That skill set that's required in Northern Ireland indeed does seem to attract uh, big business from across the world. Um, I, I suppose what I'm, I'm asking really is how, how are you engaging with the various businesses and with those who are potentially interested in Northern Ireland for other reasons to try and meet the demand of the skills that they need so that whenever um, these individuals are upskilled, that, that there will be jobs for them at the end of them? Okay, okay. thanks, Clara. Um, I suppose I would begin by saying that obviously we do have very close relationships with, for example, the business organisations and the, the further and higher education providers and the apprenticeship providers. So we, we have a good awareness of what they think their needs are um, for the next year and beyond. Um, and you're, you're right, we are constantly having to reassess where we go in terms of policy. Um, Sharon mentioned in one of her slides in the presentation back in October, um, our economic recovery work was pretty well developed at that stage. You know, we had you know five pillars set out around tourism, innovation, and skills, um, a green economy, and trade and exports. And I think that was costed then somewhere in the order of 165, 170 million pounds. Um, but that's things have changed significantly, um, mm -hmm. and some sectors out there have been profoundly altered since that last October position. So where we are now is that we have a sort of parallel process. So we've, we're working in some considerable detail, and hopefully the minister will be um, releasing it in, in the next week or two, um, a, an economic pathway to recovery, which sort of covers the next, what's needed in terms of the next 12 to 18 months. Okay? And then there's a sort of a longer term um, economic strategy or vision, which is where, where do we want the local economy to be many years down the road? And hopefully the recovery pathway paper will evolve and, and merge into that longer term document. But what we need, for example, in, in the labour market and the skills and the apprenticeships in areas like that um, will change over time. So um, the interventions over the next 12 to 18 months in terms of apprenticeships and skills, a lot of it will be remedial. A lot of it will be um, about making sure that um, the skills that businesses need just to get through the next year in particular um, can be provided. Um, but on the longer term, you can see a, a slight change in focus where you might want to shift, for example, um, apprenticeships and what they are towards more higher value added sectors um, and more of a, an investment in the, the skills based that an individual can accrue over their lifetime. So there are two pathways um, in summary, sort of short-term recovery pathway, which will embrace skills and apprenticeships, and then the longer-term vision, which hopefully will see a morph towards a more higher-value-added economy, higher-value skills invested in people. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I very much take that on board. Um, you, you had made comments earlier as well in relation to lifelong learning, and that's something that, you know, I, I entirely uh, support. I suppose that brings me on to a conversation around um, in inclusivity and, and trying to ensure that we, we uh, upskill and bring as many people within our communities into, uh, into skills and being able to help them develop and get them into work. Um, Sharon, you talked to, to about briefly about the EU replacement funding and specifically ESF and I'll declare an interest because it's an organisation which, which runs a programme in relation to that. Um, I suppose I'm concerned there, maybe there's an uncertainty there and, and you've no confirmation around that particular pot of money, but that does obviously help an awful lot of people to be able to get into the work who, who, um, who maybe have other challenges uh, uh, within their um, their lives. So I'd be keen to, to know what the department's doing as potentially a, a backup plan, if you like, if that money isn't available, you talk about 45 million, how long will that go? When will these community and voluntary organisations, namely, when will they get that assurance to know how they can plan? Um, well, 
Claire, in terms of that 45 million, there was about 19 million of that related to ESF for the likes of community and voluntary groups that you're referring to. Um, I suppose the real criticality for the EU funding was ERDF because, you know, Invest and I were, were actually out of money. Um, so we did bid in January monitoring um, for money that, al that allowed us to essentially use national funding this year. Mm -hmm. and then uh, move into next year the funding that we would have used this year um, on the EU side. So, okay. you know, that on the ERDF, that was a year, ESF had more money. Um, okay. so, so, so there is a bit more certainty for a little longer. I think, um, if memory serves me right, it takes it up to about 2023. Um, okay. But I suppose, just to give you a reassurance that, you know, just because we have been able to um, extend the EU funds. We're certainly not kind of sitting, resting easy about that. Um, yeah. One of my colleagues that leads on that um, area, um, you know, is very active in terms of her engagement with DOF and their onward engagement with Treasury. I think we absolutely, um, you know, need to understand clearly what the parameters are for the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, and what that means in terms of our funding. And we are pressing as hard as we can to try and get that clarity because you know we need it as soon as possible yeah. because we all know once the financial year starts, it kind of just sort of runs on and before you know it, you're into the next one. Um, so, so we really do need to use this time that, that, that we've sort of bought ourselves um, and use it wisely. Okay, thank you. And uh, last question, uh, Chair, if you indulge me, it was in relation to the high street support schemes and the holiday at home schemes. I think it was always going to be challenging to to fulfil those schemes and ensure that the money in relation to those was spent by by the end of this financial year. And I understand that it will require more than our executive support if we were to take that forward into the the next uh, financial year. And um, is there any indication that any of that money um, will be rolled over? Um, I, I know I'd ask the, the first minister this question. In, in the assembly, and they were they were chatting to, to treasury to, to try and see if any of those monies could be rolled over, or is that going to remain unspent and sent back? And because um, obviously we're into mid February and trying to utilise any um, surplus uh, at this point and ensure that it's spent by, by March thirty first is going to be it's going to be difficult. Um, so is there any opportunity to roll that over, or um, you know, certainly within budget? And that's maybe a general question about all funding, um, as much as it is about those particular schemes. Um, I know there's been some developments um, in the last day or two with the finance minister, I think, going to make a statement on this um, in the next day or so, if not today. Um, and I'll bring Sharon in on the detail of that. Um, it's important to differentiate between um, the, the routine carryover under the budget exchange scheme that you refer to. Mm -hmm. and it's always there, and I think that allows up to about, if resource down, about 85 or £90 million pounds can be carried into next year for normal executive assembly business, which is fine on the resource side. Um, there is a significant pot of money, as you know, related to COVID, which is ring-fenced. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of that, as I understand, will be available in next year. And we're expecting further allocations from um, a budget announcement. I think it's on the 4th or 5th of March. But I'll bring Sharon in because um, mm -hmm. she's been liaising with finance colleagues on this. Um, well, I, I suppose, Claire, I, I think what we are expecting um, is that um, you know, there, there will be a reasonable amount of carryover. I mean, I don't want to go into figures because I sort of think that's probably for the Department of Finance, um, you know, and I can't be sure that we'd be giving you the, the correct figures. Um, but I think, you know, we know that the Finance Minister has been engaging with Treasury around carryover. They are concluding in terms of spring supplementary estimates and sort of understanding where the Barnet consequentials have left, but left Northern Ireland as a block. Um, but I suppose that, that is for Northern Ireland as a block. We as DFE will still have to bid in to any pots that can be carried over um, or are available. But, you know, Mike has referred there to there is a significant amount of money at the centre. And I think it's the executive's intention is where that can be utilised this year effectively, that departments should continue to do so. And certainly I know um, DFE and, you know, I would expect other departments to still be looking for areas that that can be utilised in a year. Um, and I think as well, Mike referred to, you know, the various pots of money. So that, that kind of 
um, affects what you could use it for. But, you know, I think in summary, will we be able to carry it all over? I, I, I don't know the answer. I think it's, it's unlikely um, if, it, if, if that amount unspent remains quite high. Um, but um, I do expect there to be a reasonable amount of carryover next year. And I think, you know, it's, I mean, it's just my view, but, um, you know, it's probably reasonable to say some restrictions will be with us going into the next financial year. And therefore, you would expect some further money to come um, in terms of Barnet consequentials there too. Um, okay. so, so, you know, in terms of this department and its COVID tails, uh, um, you know, I, I would have a high expectation that they would be met. I think also what we're saying is really to reorientate the economy. Um, you know, we need money. The economic recovery plan needs to be funded. And the skills plan needs to be funded. Um, you know, and COVID has really impacted on the skills plan. Um, so we would be trying to use those pots of money um, because they're not the slide at the moment. Yeah. The other that factor... Was Sorry, the other factor that's important to bear in mind, Clara, is um, the two schemes you refer to, the High Street Voucher Scheme and, and the Tourism Scheme. Um, it all depends on where we are in regulations and the same old comments yesterday about the regulations and the restrictions likely to continue into next year. The sectors most likely to be exposed to that, those restrictions are the likes of tourism and hospitality and retail. So there's no point rolling out, you know, um, tourism recovery or, or retail spend if, if it can't actually hit the ground and have an impact. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think that's a fair point. And um, you've answered my question, Sharon, that because economic uh, recovery is somewhat linked to the, the, the COVID restrictions, um, then can we utilise the COVID money to help stimulate the economy and any recovery plans that you might have? So, look, thank you for that. And thank you, Chair. Thanks, Claire. Um, Sharon, can I just ask a quick question there, picking up on what Claire said about ESF? So in our briefing on January monitoring a few weeks back, um, it had indicated that if that was secured, it would extend the ESF to, 20, to March 2023. So has that been confirmed to those projects that they will be able to be extended for the year? Um, sorry, I'm not sure if, it's, if that has made its way out to those um, projects yet. I would need to get um, the sort of policy lead on that to just come back to you. No, that's great. Thank I, you. I, I, Chair, I could come in. So, whilst the, the the funding is there, we're in discussion with the EU about about how we extend that through, and about in fact, do we need to actually do anything uh, to can we simply uh, allocate it as it as it is to the 66 existing projects, or do we need to actually retender or do something or do a small scale exercise? So, so that's why we haven't engaged with the project yet. We, we're still uh, seeking clarification with the EU around just how we will allocate that spending. Okay, David. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, can I bring in Stuart, please? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for, for, for the information which you've all given us this morning. Um, can I start by asking you, uh, and I appreciate that the current financial year has been probably in a, a nightmare for you to operate your way through, particularly with all of the various schemes that, that came in and out uh, over that period of time. Uh, a lot of it very uh, uh, fast work which had to be done. But what I'd like to try and understand is what lessons have been learned as a result of the, la the current or just ending financial year uh, and how you will be able to improve on uh, the circumstances that you find yourselves in this financial year going into the next financial year? That's the first question of a couple of other questions. Okay. Um, so many lessons to learn. I was struggling to identify where to start, I suppose. Um, management of the, the schemes in the early stages of COVID, March, April, May time of last year, um, there was, um, it, it was quite chaotic in terms of trying to identify how to implement schemes um, and delivery schemes, legislative vehicles. That was quite complex and tortuous. Also, um, engaging with Invest NI, for example, to be a payment mechanism um, well, was difficult at the start. So I think where we are now, when we're told by the executive to do something, 
Um, it's more of a command where we say, right, this is what we're doing, rather than trying to um, encourage people to help us along the way, shall we say. So it, it, it's been a bit more hard-headed. It's also been a bit more pragmatic in terms of understanding how to use things like ministerial directions. Um, they are normally things that should be very, very precious um, and rarely used. But COVID-19 has taken this completely different place of probably managing public money never ever envisaged. So the way in which we engage with the minister um, and uh, the executive on ministerial directions, I think we've learned a lot from that um, over, over um, the last couple of months in particular. Um, that's probably the, the, the biggest lessons I've learned. The only other thing I would say is um, I still have an ongoing frustration around the financial process that's accompanied um, COVID-19 and it really has confused and disorientated um, the finance officials um, in terms of managing things like headroom under the estimates, trying to construct monitoring round positions and um, trying to separate between COVID and not on COVID ring fencing. Mm -hmm. Those things I still think are, are quite complex on it, to be honest. I, I'm not sure how David and, and Sharon have, have managed to keep themselves sane um, as they got a course through the last 12 months on that. And as I say, even now, you know, almost on a daily basis, we're having to try and get straight on our own minds where we are and things like estimate headroom. And also, those are still frustrations um, that I, 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 I struggle with, and as I say, um, I would tip my hat to where Sharon and her team have got, got us to at this point in time. I'm not sure, David, Sharon, anything from your own perspective for that? In, in terms of formal lessons, right, obviously we carry out post -program, our post-project evaluations in all our schemes, uh, so we will, and, and we, will, we will capture the official and formal learning from that, but as we've, as we've moved through the different schemes, uh, what we have done is informally we have taken the learning from the very first schemes that were, that were rolled out at PACE in March and April, and therefore as new schemes have, have come online, we have informally built those built that learning in. We've also learned how important it is to, to work collaboratively. So our colleagues with and, and partner fans and LPS with Invest and ourselves who are operating the vast majority of these schemes, they now have a regular conversations around some of the issues they're finding uh, because you know we're all in the same position of we're trying to stand up schemes, we're trying to create things that weren't there before. In many ways we're reverse engineering a, a rating system that was built to collect rates and collect money off people where that's been reverse engineered to pay money out and, and so so we're all learning we're talking together we're sharing our experiences better and we will formally capture all of this in PPEs as as and when the time comes that we can we can finish these schemes and, and, and do the formal learning then Stuart. Okay thank you that's 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 very helpful thank you um with, with the with the figure that you gave us this morning of some 95 people currently furloughed and 52,000 people uh, self-employed on, on a variety of other income streams at this point in two, at time. That brings me to the whole area of, of skills and perhaps the area of reskilling. I think it would be it would be naive to suggest that the, all of those 95,000 who are currently on furlough are, are going to go back into employment or at the very least go back into the same employment that they are that they were in uh, prior to going on furlough. That's a very large cohort of people and we hope that as many as possible will of course go back to their, their employers and will pick up where, where things left off. What plans and what budget does the department have to, to cope with that? Uh, those processes both in terms of supporting businesses which will and have survived the COVID pandemic to support them, but also what are you doing to recognise those businesses that just simply will not survive and how then that works forward either into upskilling or reskilling in the workforce? Okay, sure. Well, I suppose uh, you had line observations. Um, you're right to identify a concern about where the, the impact of COVID is likely to impact on those 150,000 on furlough or uh, self-employment support. Um, if you think about it, David earlier said he expected unemployment, or the forecasters expect unemployment to hit 100,000. Payment Council already at 60,000, so you only need 40,000 from that 150,000 on income support, and you've hit the 100,000 unemployment mark. So interventions in, in, in labour market are critical. 
Um, in terms of how do you address the most vulnerable, um, I think the funding will come from two streams. Um, we've already touched on this. The, the Ring Fence COVID funding that will be available both for TAILS into 21-22 and for new schemes that we want to bring forward. And then there's the, the, the normal, uh, what I call the pre-planned uh, interventions that we were always going to make as a department in terms of apprenticeships and training for success and essential skills. They will all continue forward anyway. Um, David, Sharon, any, any other observations? Yeah, so so it's, it's interesting. In, in 2011, we invested £99 million pounds per annum in skills programmes. Last year, we invested £75 and a half million. So, so we're, we're, less, we're £25 million pounds a year less investing now in skills programmes. So we are, and what does that mean? Well, we're not doing management programmes. All age apprenticeships have stopped. Uh, we, we aren't able to do the sectoral initiatives. So we aren't because of that funding gap. So we have, so, so that's why, you know, we will be bringing forward significant plans you know so it can't be just what are we currently doing with our current budget because that that just will not it, it's it's you could argue it's barely doing what it needs to do in the, in, when they when we had high 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 employment given the fact that we're facing you know such such massive unemployment we already have it and, and we think what may come down the line we need to be looking at all age apprenticeships we need to be putting more funding in to reskilling and retraining uh, that's why i mentioned earlier maybe i declared an interest because I'm in the over 50 category myself, but you know we put a lot of we put a lot of focus on on our young people, and of course it's really important that we don't lose generations of, of people coming on to the labour market out of school. But we we also need to focus that there are a lot of people in the over 50s who are actually being made redundant. We know redundancies are at record levels, and we need to be able to reskill them. Uh, so we do to the new opportunities that are coming, and that's why we talk about a culture of lifelong learning, upskilling and reskilling, and, and that's really going to be a vital part of the the investment in skills that we'd be bringing forward and seeking to to redress uh, and put us back to where we were perhaps 10 years ago whenever we were investing 25 million pounds a year more in our skills programs than we are able to today okay um thank you very much just final question chair um in relation to the the number of vacancies in your department and across the the, the wider uh civil service could you just uh, refresh us mike on what what is actually happening to uh both plug those gaps and i know sinead made reference perhaps to moving staff around inside but there has to be some sort of long-term strategic planning as well um to to fill those vacancies um after all the private sector is managing to fill vacancies at the moment so what is the nics doing um whereas is there a plan um to to uh, fill those vacancies and to get the appropriate people in place okay sure I'll, I'll, I'll let david go into the detail of where our next hr are in terms of their corporate recruitment plans and the difficulties encountered over the last year or so 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 look, there was a members i'm sure will be aware there was a an odd office report and through the nics recruitment uh challenges they faced uh and the lessons learned arising out of rhi not that's not that long published that report uh there has been a lot of work done centrally to try and, and pick up from from some of the issues that were arising there unfortunately COVID has has prevented those so for example this uh, last year they launched a, a staff officer on the dp competition that's our our you know towards middle to senior management ranks very important for for developing and starting strategies uh, and policy development and, and there was a new approach taken to that competition whereby we would run assessment centers uh, so we would and then you know as part of that there would be an initial test and then assessment centers those assessment centers had to stop during COVID. they, they couldn't even be carried out uh, remotely so they couldn't so whilst some of the things can be carried out remotely those couldn't and that has now caused a real problem in the system because that's a really crucial uh, grade for us uh, uh, there was, for example, an AO competition at the very uh, at the very start of the administrative ladder, uh, and and you know there was a quite a number of approach taken where you know we decided that scale that we would actually people had passed the battery of tests. The final stage would have been the interview. There was consideration given actually that would you know because we needed to recruit quickly, we would actually we have the interview for maybe the top so many on that list. So so there have been to be fair to colleagues in, in, in the next HR world, they they have been trying to respond. There are historic problems and challenges about recruitment in the NICS that you know are recognized in the audit office report that we need to be more agile we need to move at more pace 
but unfortunately doing that in the middle of a COVID crisis it, it has been really really challenging and unfortunately you know whilst we sit on the restrictions we're sitting in uh, you know the likelihood is things will probably get a little worse uh, before there's a chance to get better so they will. Okay. Chair thank you very much thank you everybody. Thank you Stuart can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight please? Okay, Chair. Uh, technical problems. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation on the information thus far. Um, clearly, uh, as an executive and department, we're entering a very difficult financial era. It had been hoped that um, the Tory government would spend its way out of a recession, but it appears that it's going to plan to cut its way deeper into a recession, which is going to cause huge difficulties for our economy moving forward. Um, I want to concentrate on the skills issue uh, and investment in skills. Uh, and I've raised this issue before, Mike, with some of your officials, though maybe not with yourself and the current officials. Sometimes I'm concerned that when we talk about the skills strategy, we talk about high level skills as IT, finances, and those sorts of services. Uh, and everybody isn't going to work in IT or, or wants to work in IT or going to work in finance services or whatever it may be. There is still a strong economy in relation to what we're known as, as vocational skills. And, and, and I mentioned the fact before that when I look out my office window, even in terms of these current difficult economic times, the different job sets and skill sets I see operating around the, the town and, and trades people moving around the town, they need support as well. So it brings me on to the point that I, I have concerns that the failure to support students in FE college, which you're not studying higher level degrees, demeans those courses and will perhaps uh, create a two level education system where young people will not be attracted to those courses. Are there any plans to expand the, the COVID support that was given to higher level students last week, a very welcome intervention, to be given to those students who are studying uh, non degree courses at universities? Um, well, John, it's my understanding that the the five hundred pound payment was made to um, students in FE colleges as well, doing the um, the higher education uh, equivalent courses, um, and on many of the other courses, there are various financial assistance packages in place. Um, I haven't got the detail um, unless. David or, or Sharon knows more. I would suggest John, maybe we write to you and to the chair with details of the packages that we think are appropriate going forward for the FE sector, or rather for the non-higher education element in the FE sector. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the various packages that are in place, Mike. Uh, my point is this, that if we don't support students who are studying none, what's referred to as higher level courses, uh, then we are going to demean those courses and that the, the, the skills that are being taught through uh, FE colleges uh, will be undermined and we won't attract uh, students to those courses and undermine a, 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 an important sector of our economy. So, I would ask that the department look at offering COVID uh, disruption payments to those students as well, because I think uh, when we look at our economy and as we move forward with our economy, there are sectors, and I understand that tourism is under pressure at the moment, but tourism will come back and it, it, it will be a growing sector of our economy. Uh, skills in the building trade and other trades will come back and will be an important part of our economy. Uh, and, other, and other courses offered by FE colleges. If we demean those courses by not offering COVID payment disruptions, then we're undermining our skills strategy. 
so, so John, if I could can certainly we, we can check the the second area. My understanding is exactly as Mike's that uh, the equivalent was the the full time higher education for the for the five hundred pound COVID payment. We'll certainly come back to you about those who are in vocational courses. But to pick up uh, about you know you're quite right. Not everybody is going to be studying for a PhD, and not everybody's going to go into digital. Uh, so they're not. What one of the skills uh, gaps that we've had because of the funding over the last number of years has been we haven't been able to develop all the apprenticeships or indeed sector own initiatives. But again, a lot of our essential skills work, and there's a really good NISRA report uh, that I encourage uh, members maybe to look at on our website. Uh, NISRA have done an evaluation of our essential skills over the last 18 years, and, and what they'll show is that you know over 53% of all enrolments to that are coming from people from the two lowest uh, areas of deprivation. Uh, so there, so there's a direct correlation between between pupils enrolling in these essential skills courses uh, and, and coming from from areas where where uh, you know they they need numeracy, literacy, and ICT at entry level, level one, level two, which is you know at the significant levels we're supporting. So so we do recognise that our skills strategy has to tackle. You know, the fact that there are more workers in Northern Ireland with no formal qualifications at all uh, compared to elsewhere. So we, we recognise we have to tackle right from entry level uh, and that's what our essential skills looks to do right up through into higher education as well. So so there is a commitment in our skills, our new skills strategy that's being developed to, to do all of those things. Happy to come back to you on the, the issue about the vocational payment of the £500. Yeah. Uh... I appreciate that, and um, you make a, a point, and a point I've made myself previously in relation to this. Those students who currently aren't receiving a COVID disruption payment are more likely to come from a socially deprived background than those who quite rightly are getting a COVID disruption payment, so I'll ask that to be looked into. The other yeah. issue... Uh, uh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, so we will come back to you with more detail on that, John, but there are, there are mechanisms already in place and plans for more. So, for example, those... Um, Groups that you talk about in, in, in FAE, you know, there are things like digital hardship funds that have been put in place, you know, to be rolled out, and there are other plans as well. So we'll come back to you with the detail of that. Yeah, I, I'm more interested in you coming back to me with the detail of how you're going to square the circle in the sense of uh, why FE students are, are, or how you're going to support FE students in terms of the COVID disruption payment. But we'll have that discussion another day. Uh, I, I wanted to discuss just the element of how the departments are approaching the COVID disruption payment. And you make a very valid point, Mike, in the sense of uh, the departments in your department or Saxon's your department were never equipped or skilled to issue such large scale uh, payments out to, out to industry. It just was never part of your, your business makeup. And that has caused huge problems for your departments and for, and as you mentioned, for, for your staff who are under extreme pressure. Uh, so, but I think there, there, there's there's a tendency still to try and put a square accountancy peg into a round hole, and there has to be an acknowledgement. And we as politicians have to give you the political cover to do this. That there is going to have to be a, 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 an emergency response to the accountancy role of departments, as much as there is in terms of getting the finances out the door. And I, and I fear sometimes that the balance has, has, has went the wrong way because of, at times, unfair criticism in the recent past of officials about payments going to certain sectors they shouldn't have went to. And I said at the start of this pandemic that the, the, the rule book should be ripped up and thrown out the window. And I think the minister has used that back to me in the chamber in terms of, of a response to some of the criticism. I have to say, not for me, because I, I don't think I'm on record as criticising that any department for trying to get money out the door and if, and if problems arose from that, uh, then that can be looked at another time. But it has to be looked at through the prism of the emergency we're responding to. Or is the, the officials within your department, make, or even in terms of the permanent secretary level, are you still of the view, are you still believe that there is unfair criticism or unfair pressure on you to get every accountancy box ticked rather than getting uh, every getting the support out the door to those businesses yeah I have no hesitation in answering that John I, I do believe there's unfair pressure um, to comply um, in the current environment and I'll give you some examples of why I think it's unfair 
So I mentioned earlier about, you know, we're creating new processes to get money out the door as quickly as possible. Um, and we're still getting clobbered left, right and centre about other payments going from DFE to an individual and payments also going from Department of Finance to the same company or whatever. And we are trying to claw that back under mechanisms in place and we'll try and rectify that. But, you know, we're acutely aware of the of, of, of how that plays out in the public domain, this perception of departmental officials being incompetent and not knowing what they're doing. And then also in parallel with that, there is um, a requirement to be seen to comply with managing public money. And we will always do that. Um, we will always do that. But where, where, where it becomes frustrating then is when, you know, um, other stakeholders decide to become involved and ask for um, uh, an investigation or a report or uh, some sort of in, uh, inquiry as to what's going on. Um, and I find that particularly frustrating at this point in time when we are still frantically trying to get money out through the door on a range of schemes, whether it be CRBSS or large hospitality. Uh, there's a range of schemes that we're trying to do that. And at the same time then we've been asked to, to the same staff are being asked to stop that down tools and then deal with requests for information from a host of other individual organizations and because they're 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 they're, they're um, doing an investigation as to what went wrong previously. So I, I, I I'll be honest, Johnny, I, I find that incredibly frustrating at the minute that we've been asked to um, comply wholeheartedly with um, financial requirements, financial reporting requirements, while at the same time there's an expectation that we will do things as quickly as possible. As I say, you know, I think I'm now up to 11 ministerial directions already this year. It's, it's wholly unheard of, and it puts accounting officers in an incredibly difficult position. Sure, I'll just end on, on this point, because I'm aware there's other members <coughs> looking in. Well, I, I, I agree with you in the sense that, uh, of course, that we have to monitor and be cautious of incompetence, or we have to ensure there's no fraud. But the, th those are the minimum uh, in terms of, I, I don't believe those are huge problems at this time. I think what we have to do as politicians and as a civil service, and we as politicians have to give the civil service the space to do this, is to react to the emergency in front of us and ensure that businesses are receiving the financial support they require. We can look at this at another time, but it has to be looked at through the fact we were dealing with an emergency, not just simply as, as an, an accountancy role. So uh, uh, thank you for all your help and your department's helped thus far. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring in John Stewart, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can. Um, Mike, Sharon, David, thank you so much for your presentation so far. And can I just start by echoing the comments made by other members, just in terms of your staff, those who are sadly, what you're telling us today, that uh, have taken on well, and also just to acknowledge the massive pressure that you and the staff are under in these really difficult times, especially um, understaffed, given the numbers that you're talking about today. Um, these are hugely difficult times and huge pressure on them. So I, I do want to thank you and the team, especially those who are listening today, because any time I've come to the Department for Assistance at a lower level, they've always come back to me um, very quickly. Um, as John rightly says, you know, you're dealing with things as well that, that probably the Department was never really designed to do, and that was the rule out of grants. And again, we're thankful for that. And I think sometimes it's about managing expectations. And one of my concerns is maybe not even being the delays, because we understand that with the due process that's going to be and diligence that's going to be followed. But it's maybe just that lack of communication. And uh, in the absence of communication, then businesses and individuals who are waiting in grants maybe then start to panic and contact the department, contact individuals, and that then adds to further pressure for staff who are having to deal with these calls. And we heard that last week from Invest and I as well. So maybe if, if if that is one thing we can get across, particularly to the minister, is just to have that ability to maybe communicate with the public who are waiting for them on a more regular basis. Um, and that would be very helpful from my point of view, and I'm sure from others as well. But also to echo John O'Dowd's comments, I think that you know, people, I find it very frustrating, especially what Mike's saying, that we have people in the same breath calling for the grants to be delivered and support and get them to be delivered as quickly as possible. But at the same time, they're the first ones to jump up and be outraged whenever it transpires that 0.1% of those grants were sent out incorrectly. 
Um, there will be a time down the line to look at that, but I don't think it's now. And I, I think anybody who's getting in the way of that and impeding the work of the civil service and the associated um, organisations and departments um, is not being helpful. And I guess a time down the line. Um, just to come to what you're briefing us today, first of all, we talk about the £167 million pounds that have been submitted in bids for the um, financial recovery. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around that. It talks about that will be to deliver the economic recovery plan, but the economic recovery plan is still in development. I'm assuming it's further enough down the development road to know how much money would be needed or what comes first, the money or, or the plan. Can you just give me an idea of maybe when we'll see that economic recovery plan um, published or at least come to the committee for consultation? Um, um, is that one six seven million speculative based on what might come out of that plan? Okay, John. So the the one hundred and sixty seven million was the costing that we put against an economic recovery plan back in October of last year for the twenty one twenty two financial year. Okay, and obviously things have moved on considerably since then, both in terms of our costings and also the um, the coverage of the economic recovery plan and the range of interventions in that. So that that's all. A work in progress and as I mentioned the economic recovery plan is nearing completion and I think the Minister would like um, to, to bring it into play in, in the next week or so. Um, Sharon's touched on elements of it for example the £50 million fund for skills um, uh, remediation in 21-22 so um, it's constantly changing and the, the, the reason why I'm reluctant to give you a date is I, you know hand on heart I, I, I don't know when economic recovery starts and um, because you know um, certain sectors you know are holding their breath you know yeah. the obvious yeah. ones have been tourism and hospitality and we can't give them a date for when we say well this is when you you can start to plan to recover and um, similarly for you know many other sectors they they don't know um our you know their their approach to investing for example on, on apprenticeships when should i take on apprenticeships in april um, or should I wait until I know that the market starts to reopen? So those are all the sort of questions we're still grappling with. But as I say, it's pretty well advanced. Um, John, I'm, I'm not sure if you have a, a more up-to-date figure on where we think the pathway costings are going to go um, for 21-22. Um, no, Mike, we don't um, at the minute. I think as you sort of outlined, things are still moving. Um, you know, whenever those bids were put in, they were marker bids because we realised that we would need a significant amount of funding um, to deal with those two areas. Um, but, but things have moved on and yes, the plans have refined, but we, we don't have um, sort of a, a final amount at the minute. Okay. No, well, thank you for that. I mean, I, I, it's good news to hear at least that, that um, ERAP will be coming maybe in the next week or so. Um, no doubt the committee will get to look at that hopefully very quickly. Um, so that is helpful. Um, one aspect I just wanted to discuss, given the you know, we've been talking about the, the real impact that the um, pandemic is having on jobs and uh, livelihoods here, and um, hopefully as part of that recovery, maybe for those who have lost their jobs, will be the opportunity maybe to go into self-employment and to start their own business. And we have seen that in previous um, recessions and downturns that people have uh, unfortunately lost their jobs but then come back out to start their own enterprises. Um, I'll, I'll declare at this stage an interest because I'm chair of the micro and small business um, APG. But um, I just want to know, you know what plans and what support um, will be directed towards the likes of our enterprise agencies and programs to get people back into work through entrepreneurship given that over 90% of based on those micro and SMEs? Um, well, I suppose the, the, the first observation I would make is obviously the key player in this will be uh, Invest Northern Ireland and Intertrade, um, and it would be for them to shape the bids that they want to take forward. Obviously, there's some schemes already in place, but I think another key player that we maybe probably haven't brought in as much as we should have up to now is the, the 11 councils who do have a role to play in economic development. So we maybe need to think about getting them more joined up at the, at the micro business level, as you call it, John, with where okay. Invest NI and Intertrade are going in this. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, just the last one, because again, conscious of time and other members coming in. Um, just if, if the department had any um, consultation with the Treasury regarding um, the prospects and the amount of funding from the new Shared Prosperity Fund, and also, you know, what predictions do you have about the impact of the um, the absence of EU funding 
um, if, that's, if that one is not replaced from Treasury. Okay, well, David, David or Sharon, we touched on this yeah. briefly. Sorry, Mike, I was just going to say, so Treasury uh, GB, uh, have confirmed that when, when the share facility fund is up and running, they expect it to be about a £1.5 billion pound programme. So they do, uh, as part of their levelling up agenda, we would need to uh, be tapping into about 5%, just under 5% of that, to, to just meet what, where we currently are. So as I say, it's at exceptionally early stages uh, and how that's going to be delivered. We do know it will be delivered on a UK-wide basis, uh, So we do, but we're still uh, attempting uh, our own minister and the Minister of Finance, we're still attempting to get in there, as the other devolved regions are, to try and help shape and influence what direction that goes. Uh, there has been a commitment that you know the, the same amount of money will be put back in. So, so what we're trying to do now is understand where we need to be to bid to make sure we are getting in to at least the five percent we need to make sure that we're not losing out. Okay, thanks, for that, David. Chair, a number of other things, but um, I'll thank the. Thank you, Miguel, and other members come in. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks, John. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for the presentation. Now, just a couple of quick points. A lot has been covered. I think we all do appreciate the work of the various departments make in relation to the handling of grants, the department, your own Department of Economy, Invest NI, and the Department of Finance. I think all of us that are proactive on the ground have been involved in chasing a lot of these grants, and yes, sometimes they are slow one, but we appreciate that a number of the staff are working from home as well, so communication can be difficult, but uh, we do, and I think it's important we put on record our thanks and appreciation to the staff that have worked and gone the extra mile. As the Minister said the other day, £370 million has been paid out. It's a significant amount of money, and um, I believe it has been so important for to sustain business through this pandemic. A couple of points, Mike. Um, the point about the 25% vacancy rate, I suppose, has been well covered, but um, it comes back to you, I suppose, and what, what, is, what are you doing about it or what has been done? The, the issue about COVID, we're a year into COVID. That reason is given as to why recruitment hasn't been processed, but surely there are ways around. Uh, using online facilities for, for interviews, etc. And also, my other point is the energy branch. We're aware of vacancies, or high rate of vacancies energy branch. Has that been addressed, the problem of getting recruiting people in the energy branch? But can I just ask anybody who is on the uh, star list that isn't speaking to mute themselves because of a wee bit of feedback, interrupt them, Gordon? Sorry. Chair, I'm not sure that we have Gordon in the spotlight. Can we just make sure Gordon's been brought into the spotlight, please? Okay. Right. Did you hear that, Meg? The point so yeah, far? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've got that, Gordon. Thanks. Um, so, on the uh, what are we doing about the vacancies? Yeah. Um, David's touched on um, the difficulties that the, the corporate centre and the civil service HR processes and the difficulties they're encountering because of um, COVID and we are as a department we rely on them to deliver staff and um, so where we are now um, as I said at the very very start we're, we're getting to a position and a conversation with the minister shortly and um, where I think we're going to have to take a decision to ease back on pace of delivery or stop doing some things um, um, in the non-COVID space because I, unfortunately I think COVID interventions will be with us for many months to come. So I think we will stop doing some things and we will ease back on the pace of doing other things just to try and free up staff to reallocate to the higher priority areas. Um, but you, you mentioned the, the, the energy vacancies and they, they have a considerable number of vacancies um, across the energy group. Um, and just uh, I'll bring Sharon in because she probably is closer to detail me, but it, it does give you a perfect insight into our frustrations of, with um, filling vacancies. So I think um, Back in November time, um, the Energy Group engaged with the HR process to fill, I think it was 17 vacancies, Sharon, um, and recruitment yes, rounds right. and, right. and interviews. And I don't think we've got a person yet, have we? Um, I don't think they have got a person yet, no. Yeah. Not. So, you know, in four months, um, despite interviews and all having been concluded, we still haven't got a person in, and that's a DP grade. Oh, 17 vacancies, I think, were at DP grade which is a pretty important grade, as David was saying earlier, to get filled. 
So, you know, that, that, that's our frustration. We've tried all sorts of innovative approaches in terms of engaging with the Strategic Investment Board and bringing people in and succumbing. So a whole raft of um, alternative approaches, shall we say, to try and alleviate some of these pressures. But um, you maybe get one person here or one person there. You certainly don't get 330 odd people. Okay, now I appreciate that. At least you're looking at alternatives and it's important that you, that you are because problems arise and then we're told at our level that because of vacancies that the work wasn't addressed and issues were not dealt with and we, we don't want to hear that at a later stage but uh, we, we appreciate the, the, the difficulty you're having. Just a couple of points in relation to the economic and business development. Um, in the pie chart it talks 132 million and part of that 100 million is for um, Invest NI. Something I've raised before is a need for continued support for existing businesses that uh, are working their way through the pandemic. A number of their staff are on furlough. Um, what are we doing to support those existing businesses uh, through this pandemic to ensure that uh, at the recovery stage they will be able to maximise their, their use of resources, get back into full production and, and bring people off furlough back into work? My point is basically around uh, sustaining those businesses and quite large businesses that we have sustained, I suppose, and supported over the years through Invest NI. What's been done to um, maximise that and to, to try and reduce the impact of the, the return to work? Okay, so those larger businesses, particularly in the manufacturing space, businesses in general obviously have had significant uh, relief already, for example, through the rating mechanism where they've been exempted from, from rates um, and there are um, a, a wide range of um, schemes available, available either reserved or devolved so, and one in particular that we're looking at now at the minute is um, some mechanism to assist companies through for example a possible top up for their overhead costs for staff or on furlough so I say you know the rates scheme is already in place and has been from the earliest stages of COVID and that's worth a considerable amount of money to businesses, large and small. But we're continuing to look at um, new schemes that we can bring along, particularly to assist on the costs of furlough. Um, I'm not sure if David or Sharon want to add anything further to that. No, there, there's been like the, the schemes have helped nearly forty thousand businesses uh, across Northern Ireland already, as the minister outlined the other day. With you know so much three hundred and sixty three hundred seventy million pounds already paid out, we appreciate that you know for some businesses that might not be enough. But actually, uh, alongside the furlough and those sort of initiatives that we're doing locally, you know that is that is the, the level of help we can put into Manitoba, and, and hopefully it will it will help some businesses survive through to whenever restrictions ease. Uh, and they say we're always open to looking at, at other opportunities should there be funding and should there be bandwidth so that the, the department to actually do that and make that happen. Good, I'm glad you're looking at that top up scheme as well. I know it's, we've talked about it in here um, and it is I think a bit of a reality. You realise the, the costs that are accumulating for businesses that have staff on furlough that still have a lot of uh, overheads to meet and I think it, it would be great if that could come through. My last point just on tourism, £19 million there uh, for tourism. Uh, we are very much aware of the initiatives that, ha that were planned last year, which didn't happen. Are we hoping to uh, reinvigorate those plans, all being well, if uh, we get an uplift, in, obviously, in, in the health restrictions this year, and trying to, uh, I suppose, focus on tourism at home, holiday at home, uh, and trying to attract visitors, I suppose, in a limited capacity? Will there be schemes and will there be support for to try and drive those initiatives forward? Um, it, it, indeed, Gordon, uh, as you know, the Minister chairs the Tourism uh, Recovery Steering Group. And in fact, the next meeting is planned for, I think it's the 24th of February, um, which takes into sort of phase two of planning. Um, obviously, the difficulty is you, you, don't win, you don't know when to start implementing issues because you don't know when tourism is going to be in a position to start um, reopening to commercial activity but the plan at, at the minute has or it's grouped under seven themes um, and they are really about creating consumer confidence trying to sort of stimulate demand in, in the local market and um, 
trying to keep some businesses on what I would call life support or business survival, which is things like the grants to the B&B uh, sector, um, sort of trying to also protect connectivity for our, sort of uh, R&C connectivity, um, and then trying to uh, make sure that the local market remains competitive for, for a time when markets do reopening, um, and then really just trying to um, encourage a, a debate about what's the strategic direction of tourism um, and um, what are the key opportunities that need to be exploited in a sort of post-COVID environment. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay. David and Sharon, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, can we bring Paul into the spotlight, please? Paul, can you hear us? He's on mute. I think you might still be on mute. Is that better now? Yep, can hear you now. Great, thank you, and thank you for your welcome earlier in the meeting. Um, Mike, just some quick questions. The draft program for government uh, outcome six, more people working in better jobs. Uh, I just want to ask, what, what's going to be the baseline measurement um, that you will be assessed against that uh, program for government for more people working in better jobs? Um, I'll, I'll hand over swiftly to my colleagues on that one, Paul. Um, I presume it would probably be the reason why I hesitate is you know I know there was ongoing discussions around what the indicator means in terms of the definition of a better job. Um, so I, I, we may have to come back to you in writing on that, but I'll ask if David or Sharon knows and Graham, but I would prefer to come back to you with the detail of where we are in negotiations with the analytical services team and PEO. So, Paul, uh, just yesterday uh, I saw a report published by NESRA which uh, actually touched us. I didn't and haven't yet. It's one of the many emails in my inbox to, to read and study. What I'll do is uh, we, we'll write to the county and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, draw your attention to the report. It does have a number of indicators where you know, we have been working up. This isn't a new indicator in the draft programme government. There's been, there's been something about better jobs uh, for some time now. So we've been talking to NESRA and working up a, a range of, of data that might fall into that uh, uh, that judgment. So, so let me let me get the report uh, and send it to you, and then happy to to take any further questions that might arise out of that, if that's helpful. Apologies, I, I just haven't been able to get a chance. It is literally hot off the press. No, you're okay because obviously your your PFG outcomes uh, often dictate to the department then where its spend is and all the strategies that flow from it. I raise it in the context of the increasing numbers of people unemployed the cliff edge that's coming with uh, the ending of the furlough scheme and that potential 100,000 figure. So obviously, if there was a draft PFG indicator being put into a document that really isn't realistic, um, there's no point putting it in there um, because it'll only become a rule that's used against the department, um, which would be unfair um, given the circumstances that you've had to deal with. So I just raise it in that context. The, the Chief Medical Officer's announcements yesterday of um, these lockdowns continuing for the rest of the year, maybe even into next year. Well, what engagement, Mike, has there been with your department and the Department of Health before these announcements were made? Um, and do we know, does that mean retail, hospitality um, are, are now going to be closed for the foreseeable future? And what, therefore, will be the impact in terms of the financial support packages that the department will be seeking? Um. Well, well, obviously, there's a, a number of sort of cross-departmental working groups on COVID. So there's the Civil Contingencies Group, which indeed meets this afternoon, chaired by the head of the Civil Service, and Health are on that with um, the, the other key departments and um, other key services like the PSNI um, and local councils. There's also, as you know, then there's the COVID, the Executive COVID Task Force, um, uh, which also meets um, on, a, on a, a regular basis. Um, so. There's lots of work going on around things like uh, recovery, communications, resilience, um, and different departments are, are feeding in. The difficulty is, um, while ourselves and communities and others can input where we think we need to go in terms of a um, social recovery or economic recovery, um, as you know, there isn't a, 
a, a definitive timeline attached to the health side of this. And so, we, you know, we, we were reliant on um, health colleagues and setting out milestones that the rest of our work can shape around. And I, I wasn't aware of those comments from the CMO, CMO that were made yesterday and, and until last night. Um, but as I say, um, he gives the CMO does give regular updates to the executive on where we where where we are in relation to COVID and his understanding of what lies ahead. But as I say, um, there isn't a definitive map set out by the CMO with definitive dates that we can start to work to. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I appreciate the environment you're working in. I know the CMO's comments sent a shockwave through a lot of different businesses that have been closed for several months now, um, and there's despair as a result of the remarks that were made, particularly in light of the uh, rapid decrease in transmission rates, hospital admissions, um, that there doesn't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel, and hope has been extinguished as a result of those comments. So I think it is important that the Department of Economy um, continue to champion that this is a, a crisis of protecting people's lives and livelihoods um, because the economic distress that rolls it into financial, physical, mental distress in, in business community and people that are dependent on those jobs is hugely significant um, and it is a, a big issue for a lot of people. In, in terms of confidence for entrepreneurs, Given that small businesses in particular have been hardly hit by these restrictions and big business has been able to continue um, uh, and that has created a, an inequality of treatment and how these regulations have been applied, is there a plan to try and instill confidence for those entrepreneurs that we depend on to create new business um, and what confidence will they have that the, the government will have their back in the future? Um. There isn't a, 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 a we haven't got a, a definitive work stream set up that focuses solely on um, entrepreneurship, um, but that would come under the pillar of investment and, and trade opportunities. And um, so I think the, the the best we can do as a department is create a policy environment that's conducive to entrepreneurship growing and new businesses starting up and expanding. That's the best we can do at this stage. Um, and uh, assure them that you know the agents of delivery, whether it be Invest or Tourism NI or Intertrade, they have policy interventions, whether it be financial assistance or just guidance in place that, as I say, is creates an environment conducive to growth for entrepreneurs. Um, the, 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 the worry, and it goes back to your previous question, Paul. The, the worry is um, it's all about timing now, given the uncertainty of COVID. Um, as you know, the Department for the Economy back um, last summer, the start of last summer, published its plan for economic recovery, and that was that was warmly received by all, all throughout the business community and, and beyond um, as, as a roadmap. The difficulty was we went too early last summer in releasing that and making that public, because then along came the second wave of COVID and everything was der derailed and we lost momentum. And um, so that, 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 that's the concern I have about how do we start to have a debate about economic recovery and where we go um, when we have no certainty about where the sort of the health dimension of, of COVID recovery um, ties into it. And that's the point I was making about no definitive milestones. And finally, for me, Madam Chairman, um, let, let me commend the department because the number of schemes that have been developed um, I, given the, the short lead-in times, I do think is significant, um, and I, I would recognise the pressure that that has created on the system to do that, and your staff um, will have been very significant. Um, so let me commend you for that. I, I take on board the, wide, the wider point that you have made about uh, collective resources being pooled, and it's in that context there has been one other scheme that I know the economy minister is supportive of, which would be specifically targeted for travel agents within the tourism industry. The finance minister has indicated that he supports this scheme. Uh, I know the first minister has asked the head of the civil service to assist in trying to pull together a bespoke scheme. And in light of continued restrictions and the impact on that industry, um, is this a scheme that can be developed to support those travel agents? And I say that, up to in the context that I know the, the finance 
uh, Minister has released his statement today and the embargo lifted at half 11, that we still have £250 million of resource available to be paid out before the end of this financial year. So I know that you have went the extra mile already. And I think for some within other industries, they're still asking for more. Is this a scheme that can be developed and pooling the collective resources across the civil service to deliver it before the end of this financial year? And with that, Madam Chairman, I'll conclude and, and thank you for your time um, to Mike and the team. Okay, thanks, Paul. And just to pick up on your last comment in relation to travel agents and, and tourism, um, I think there, there's, a, there's an issue for the department here in terms of communication um, because um, there's been a lot of um, misunderstanding, shall we say. So if you take travel agents, um, a lot of travel agents have already benefited from various schemes, whether it be the, the rate release schemes or if you remember back um, last summer, the 10K and the 25K schemes. So a number of travel agents have already benefited from the schemes that are already in place. Um, but there does seem to be um, a lack of awareness in some that they could have applied. So what we're doing is, um, we have some papers going to the minister that you'll take to the executive. It's, it's about making making people aware that there are schemes out there that they could apply to. So, for example, um, we're looking to do uh, further work in relation to the CRBSS scheme. You know, so it's about making sure and explicitly the travel agents know that they can apply to schemes like that moving forward. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, can we bring in Christopher to the spotlight, please? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Oh, good. Um, well, firstly, I, I want to associate myself with uh, what Paul Given just said in relation to the recent um, announcement by the, the recent comments by uh, the Chief Medical Officer. It does seem to me as though every time it looks like we're getting to the end of the tunnel, and there's light at the end of the tunnel, someone goes and builds more tunnel. Um, and that is concerning um, because our priority obviously is an economy committee has to be about um, rebuilding the economy of Northern Ireland in the back of all of this. I'm also mindful of the fact that, you know, when we're talking about getting money out to businesses, this is borrowed money and it's going to have to be paid back. And the only way that can be done is if we have a strong economy can I ask what assessment has been made of the number of businesses that are likely to collapse when this funding runs out and we're no longer able to get it out the door to them? I'm not sure if we have analysis on that base of terms of when funding comes to end. I'll, I'll, we know how many businesses we have assisted to this point in time, somewhere in the order of 40,000 businesses have been assisted across the various schemes. Um, and we know when some of the schemes, for example, we know you know the furlough schemes due to end end of April. We we various bits, but I'm not sure we have a detailed analysis on you know macroeconomic impact would be, for example, in the labour market. I'm not sure if David Bashar or anything that we house on that. I'm sorry, you're you're breaking up there. I didn't really catch the end of that. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if we have a bespoke piece of internal research to get that precise metric that you're looking for, but I'll ask maybe David or Sharon. But if they don't know the answer, then I'll ask our analytics team in the department who have a lot of research underway. They may actually have something that I'm not excited on. Okay. So, Mike, I, I don't think that exact analysis is actually available. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the major accounting firms, there's been a lot of forecasts about where the economy is going to go. I think the trouble is that because nobody yet knows when the recovery can officially begin, it's very difficult to be precise about how, who will survive that. Because the longer this current situation develops, the harder it's going to be for companies to recover. So, so I, I don't think that, that precise level of detail will exist. Just recently. We see the Austin Bank reporting a business activity in Northern Ireland is still amongst the lowest. Uh, we see the National Institute for Economic and Social Research just a couple of days ago putting out a report suggesting that the long term effect of the downturn will be more profound in Northern Ireland than other regions in the UK. So, so the, the forecasts that are currently there to what do, do not get good reading for the Northern Ireland economy. But in terms of exactly what that will mean, I suppose we need to have the timetable that Mike talked about earlier about when that recovery can actually begin before we can start to make any sort of uh, reasonable assessments about who might be 
going to come through that uh, recovery with us, or who might need to to diversify or, or, or actually, unfortunately, uh, stop trading. The thing, I think a figure has been, or an assessment I know has been provided in terms of the likely level of unemployment, and that's, I think, was it anywhere between 30,000 and 100,000 um, jobs lost? So if you meet it in the middle, you're talking 70,000. Uh, is that, that, that figure's accurate, isn't it? That was, that was released about three, four weeks ago, a piece of information on that? Yeah, we already have 60,000 unemployment, uh, and there's yes, and that can actually rise to, to 100,000 once furlough ends by quarter two and quarter three this year. Yeah, um, I just wonder, um, I appreciate the work that has been done and what other members have said in relation to um, getting the money out the door and what have you. I'm just wondering, has any assessment been made of you know, the numbers who are still waiting for support or have fallen through, uh, I mean, it's, it's just the nature of things that there are going to be people that will fall through gaps, I understand that. Just wondering, has any assessment been made of the numbers in that regard? Um, no, I suppose the only metric that we have is um, we know across the various schemes any companies are eligible to apply. We know how many actual applicants come in. Um, and what uh, one observation I would make over the last month or so in terms of the most recent schemes is that we're, we're getting um, much lower applications than we expected um, across some of the schemes, um, and that's generating some of the underspend um, that has, has been retained at the centre. So, um, you know, it's difficult, you know, we don't have a counterfactual out there in terms of assessing. All we can say is we know how many businesses we think are going to apply. And it's been diminishing over over recent months. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you, Christopher. I think that that's everybody, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Sure. yep. Um, Mike and Sharon and David, thank you very much for the the update this morning. Um, and I, I think the clerk might be in touch with some um clarifications and and um and responses just in relation to to the briefing. So um, thanks for that, and um, I'm sure we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Chair, um, what, we, what we've often done following a budget briefing is write out to the larger ALBs to seek their view on the budget position. Um, they've written, so members will have noticed on the slides, there's some of the ALBs mentioned, the likes of uh, Invest NI, Tourism NI, Tourism Ireland, Intertrade. So usually what we, we've done before, if members are content, is write out to them to seek their views. Um, okay, sorry, can the members just put themselves on mute? Thanks. Go ahead. So, Chair, if members are content, we'll, we'll go and do that again. Yep. Yep. Um, is there other things there? That Chair, the other, the other thing on? perhaps that... Um, might have come out of the briefing was members talked a great deal about skills, as did the um, officials. Um, the, there was a, a bit of an appeal there, I suppose, from officials regarding um, support for the bids they'll be putting in over probably the, the very long term, as, as well as medium term, um, around skills projects. Uh, some of the bids were identified in the slides. So uh, I suppose if members were content to write to TEO uh, indicating uh, the committee's support for bids coming in around skills, but also um, maybe writing to the minister to urge that bids are prepared that, that can go in um, once it's been identified that there is funding going to be available going forward. If members are content, we can, we can proceed with those letters. Yep. Great. Um, is there anything else that members want to specifically point pick up on? Sure. Um, go ahead, John. Uh, thank you. Um, specifically in relation to skills, uh, Chair, I, I am concerned, as I raised with Mike and his team, that those students who aren't studying higher level, which refer to as higher level courses, are not receiving support under the COVID disruption payment announced last week. I'm, discern I'm concerned on a number of levels. As I said, the majority of those students, or many of those students, will come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or lower income families and will be, will be under significant financial pressures at the best of times, but certainly during this pandemic. And I also think it demeans those courses. 
that they have been separated out and not receiving support during the current pandemic. Uh, right, I think there, we, we, I would ask that the committee write the minister seeking what she be minded to support those students uh, moving forward for, for the reasons outlined. Uh, are members content to, to write to the minister on that basis? Great. Thank you. Um, Sinead is wanting to come in there as well. Well, so just on the back of that from, from John, um, I'm also concerned that uh, our Northern Ireland students that are studying in um, Scotland, England and Wales have been left out of, of student support as well, and it's a significant number, up to 18,000 students. So it's important, I mean, they're paying even higher uh, fees in their university uh, and uh, extensive costs for accommodation. They too need uh, the support. Many of them are, are back home um, with their families. Uh, and rightly so, because uh, in many areas they've been isolated because their, their regions are in tier four and they're actually nearly in lockdown in their rooms. So um, it's good that they are back home, but they do need financial support uh, to keep going. So, you know, when we are right, and I think we need to include um, that cohort of students as well. And the students, obviously, in the Republic of Ireland didn't get any, uh, any funding um, in the COVID support program uh, announced. But I have to do, I have to say, um, um, I really welcome um, the support that was announced last Thursday for our students, but it is uh, only a step forward. We need to, to widen it out. And just, Chair, on, on the last um, issue that was mentioned by Mike um, in relation to the, the support grants, uh, where a number of support grants uh, were uh, underutilised, uh, I, I think that the, there is a, a need now to actually really drill down and look at that because some of uh, businesses got at the very, very beginning. Um, for example, um, some of our smaller hotels um, got 25,000 at, at the very beginning. Now, nobody at that time expected um, that they would be closed for the time that they have. That money has well and truly um, run out. I've had uh, very distressed uh, phone calls from, from business owners, hotel owner, owners, um, uh, right throughout Northern Ireland to say that they are under under uh, a great deal of pressure at the moment. I don't know exactly um, if their businesses will survive as, uh, as they currently stand. So what I, I think we need to write back to the department, first of all, when will all the application link uh, be sent to those that are eligible for the larger hotels? But is there a mechanism where hotels um, that uh, got the that were below the fifty one k and and got the twenty five thousand point support away the began. Is there any way that they will be able to, um, you know, be included in the larger hotel support grant? You know, by 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 way of a top up, um, because this would be pretty significant uh, and possibly uh, keep their businesses going into the future. So, I, I think there's under uh, spend in some areas. And there could be a way of that us us looking at additional support in other areas in order to make sure that we, uh, you know, support the sector to actually open up uh, when it is right uh, and safe to do so. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Peter, do you want to come Chair, in? Yeah, um, we we're already seeking a response on the smaller hotels who wouldn't naturally fall into the large hospitality and tourism scheme. We're, we're seeking a response on whether they can be included. Um, also on the time scales as well, uh, regarding when links will be sent, when are applications opening, uh, time scale for applying and so on. So as soon as we've got that, we'll bring that back to committee, Chair. Um, we'll also add to the uh, Dallow readout about um, an explanation of, of, of what has hindered um, giving the £500 to local students who are studying in, in GB uh, and um, the South um, and elsewhere. Um, so we'll seek a response on that too, Chair. Yeah, and I suppose we can reflect that we would support that those students be um, supported through the COVID disruption payment in the letter in relation to the further education students. Sorry, Gordon. Chair, just on that on the student thing, I think we all are sympathetic to those uh, Northern Ireland students who are studying in the mainland, and a lot of people are. I think we've all been lobbied about it. My understanding is that um, other jurisdictions have schemes or will have schemes, 
and we, we've got some information from the department. I think it'd be useful if we could get that information for everyone. And you know, it would be good to have not just the information but contacts in in, that, in the various jurisdictions that students and their families can contact and try and progress the possibility of getting funding. It is important, I think, that, that these students do get some, some support, those that have to travel and pay excessive fees and uh, are now have been disrupted, severely disrupted in relation to the cost and the cost of accommodation and so on. So I would be very supportive of us trying to defer to that. I, we would all genuinely um, push for and have done that, that, that this has continued right across the UK but through the Northern Ireland and I understand a lot of these students have got their funding through the Northern Ireland loan scheme and yet they don't seem eligible so if we can get that information Chair it would be useful and we get that out to, to the various constituents. Thanks Gordon. Um, sorry Stuart's looking in as well. Yeah, Chair, just to, to, to be please square the circle in relation to students, um, we need to include open university students in that discussion as well, and also part-time students. Yep, no problem, Stuart, we'll include that. And and John Stewart's looking in there as well. Yes, Chair, just to um, echo the comments made by pretty much everyone so far in terms of the letter and and seeing where possible that can be broadened out, particularly to our students stuff, studying in GP and ROI. Um, as Stuart says, part-time students, open university students. There's also a couple of anomalies for those who are based here. Um, those at Agricultural College, for example, are excluded, or not able to apply. Um, Belfast Bible College, I'm hearing this morning as well, and said they're not eligible as well because they're not affiliated to the two major universities. So I think in those set, we're probably not talking about large numbers, it would feel quite a choice if they weren't able to be included in that. And if that could be included in the letter as well, I think it'd be very helpful. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, unless there's anything else, we'll move on to our, our next briefing. Um, which is agenda num item number five, um, and it's our briefing on parental bereavement leave and pay. So there is a clerk's memo at page 25 of table papers, ministerial correspondence, and the consultation report at page 104 of your packs. Um, the minister had highlighted her intention to bring forward this legislation when she briefed the committee um, about this time last year, um, and the committee was very supportive of the proposal at that point. So I'd just like to, to bring into the spotlight, please, um, the officials, Colin Jack, Director of Business Employment, uh, or sorry, Business and Employment Regulation, Kelly Sprott, Employment Relation, and Lawrence Rogers, Employment Relations. Um, if I hand over to the officials, are they? Yep, yep. Um, to make a, an opening statement, and then we'll we'll open it up to to members for questions. Oh, okay, Chair, well, um, thank you for the opportunity to update the committee on the departmental response to parental bereavement, leave and pay. Um, I'm accompanied today by Kelly Sprott, uh, who is the policy lead on uh, work-life balance issues, and, and Lawrence Rogers from her team as well. Um, the departmental consultation response paper was published on the 20th of January, uh, I suppose since uh, that previous time where the Minister had, had briefed you on her intention to bring forward uh, legislation. Uh, the team have done a lot of work uh, and launched a consultation exercise in June uh, 2020, uh, which ran over the summer period, uh, and uh, we've had uh, 24 responses to uh, that consultation exercise. So um, you have the, uh, the response paper, um, and I'll uh, give a, a high-level overview of the responses that we've had uh, and our plans for legislation, and then uh, we'll be happy to address any queries from members. Um, so as I said, there were 36 responses to the consultation. Uh, respondents represented a cross-section of organisations, individuals, and employee and employer representative bodies. Uh, and while there were some uh, differences of opinion among the respondents uh, and uh, some comments on the detail of the proposals, um, there was overall clear support for employees and workers in Northern Ireland to have uh, at least the same right to parental bereavement leave and pay as that afforded to employees and workers across the rest of the UK. Um, the consultation sought opinion on four main pillars of the legislation, first being the definition of a bereaved parent. Uh, the second, defining how and when parental bereavement leave can be taken, 
uh, the third identifying what level and length of notice period would be necessary and then finally establishing what evidence may be required to show that an employee is entitled to leave and pay under the legislation. Um, so first of all the definition of a bereaved parent, um, there was a broad consensus that the definition uh, set out in the consultation document was appropriate and broad enough to, to address quite a range of relationships uh, between par children, parents and others who have parental responsibility for them. Um, it's also our intention to include in the definition those parents who experience the loss of a child through stillbirth after 24 weeks of pregnancy. Um, in terms of flexibility with the leave, um, there were proposals in terms of whether it could be taken in single days or in blocks of a week uh, at a time uh, and there's a general preference uh, in favour of weekly blocks. Um, that not only allows businesses to plan more effectively for absences, it also helps relieve any perceived pressure on employees uh, to return to work before they're ready. Um, in terms of the window to take, uh, parental bereavement leave. Um, there was strong support for a 56 week window uh, within which it could be taken, um, although uh, there were a few responses which expressed some misgivings about the potential impact of that on employers. Uh, but the Minister uh, agrees that 56 weeks uh, is the appropriate period uh, and recognises that bereaved parents' needs may vary greatly on a case by case uh, basis. So uh, a 56 week window also uh, in terms of um, bereaved mothers who, who have had a, a stillbirth very late in pregnancy uh, would allow them to complete their maternity leave and then take uh, the, the, the short additional period of parental bereavement leave at the end. Um, in terms of the notice uh, requirement and notice period, um, there was a range of opinions uh, expressed about whether or not uh, parents should be required or would be able to provide notice to their employer prior to taking uh, parental bereavement leave. Um, clearly, uh, that would be problematic in the immediate aftermath, or aftermath of the death of a child. Um, so in that case, um, the legislation will, will stipulate that notice should be given as soon as is practicable. In terms of leave at a later date, um, the, the consensus, I think, was that a short notice period of a week would be appropriate and would fairly balance the need of bereaved parents with those of employers. Um, in terms of the level of pay, um, all respondents expressed the belief that some payment for parental bereavement leave would be appropriate and beneficial. Um, some respondents called for an increase over the level uh, that applies in, in Great Britain. Um, that would um, differ from any uh, existing family related uh, statutory leave payment um, in, in, in all those cases. Uh, the rate that applies is £151.20 uh, per week or 90% or of, of an employee's average weekly uh, earnings, whichever is the lower. Um, and so I think we're, we're going to, to go with that uh, level of. Uh, 151 pounds 20 um, in the legislation. The qualifying period, um, there was um, an issue raised by almost half of the respondents about uh, whether payment of parental bereavement pay should be a day one right, um, which uh, wasn't what was proposed. The, the, the proposal was that there would be a six month or 26 week uh, qualifying period before uh, those claiming uh, parental bereavement pay would be eligible uh, to receive it. Um, the Minister gave quite a lot of consideration to the responses that we received on this issue and we uh, as a team did quite a lot of work uh, in detail uh, working with uh, Her Majesty's Re Revenue and Customs uh, and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial uh, Strategy looking at what the potential implications were if we in Northern Ireland were to uh, adopt a tw uh, 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 this as a day one right uh, rather than the 26 week uh, qualifying period in, in Great Britain. Um, after full consideration of the issues, uh, I suppose including timing, uh, the cost uh, of, of departing um, and I suppose also the thankfully very small number of parents who might find themselves in the position of 
uh, losing a child under the age of 18 uh, during the first 26 weeks with a new employer. Uh, the Minister has decided to maintain the requirement for a 26 week uh, qualifying period. However, we, we uh, will be looking at whether there might be scope for uh, those in that position uh, to, uh, to get a payment through the Department for Communities through their discretionary uh, funding scheme. So uh, you know, we, we will want to look further at that issue. Um, in terms of the notice period and evidential requirements, uh, there is a broad spectrum of opinions amongst respondents about whether or not brief parents should be expected to give notice and provide evidence of the child's death. Um, there was a belief that notice and evidence would be necessary in order to meet the administrative and payroll aspects of the payment um, and consistency with the, the legislation in, in Great Britain uh, featured heavily among the responses. Um, and I mean, our view is that the same considerations concerning sensitivity and practica practicability should apply in relation to parental bereavement pay as, as they do in, in terms of parental bereavement leave. Um, so any parents wishing to receive the payment will have 28 days to notify, notify the employer um, after the commencement of any parental bereavement leave. Um, and in terms of the evidential requirements, uh, those will be light touch. There, there should be a, a declaration of entitlement in terms of the, the relationship with the child, uh, the name of the parent claiming the payment and the date of the child's death. Um, in terms of the legislative requirements, introducing statutory parental bereavement leave and pay will require the development of both primary and subordinate legislation. Um, the uh, primary legislation will provide the relevant entitlements and the subordinate regulations will, will make provision in more detail. Um, we are on target to have a bill ready for introduction to the Assembly in May. Uh, of this year. Um, that should allow time for the bill to complete its passage and become law before the end of the current mandate. Um, and then uh, there will be a, a further three month period for the, uh, the subsequent uh, regulations to be progressed. Um, so just in conclusion, um, there was unanimity in the consultation exercise that the introduction of parental bereavement leave and pay uh, is the right thing to do. Uh, that was echoed across all the respondent groups. Um, it's important to emphasise many employers um, already have provisions in place uh, to deal with uh, the needs of parents in this situation that go well beyond the statutory minimum provisions uh, that the legislation will introduce. Uh, the Minister has recognised this and would encourage that good practice to continue. Um, it, it is a statutory minimum uh, for employers to provide and will ensure that all employees are afforded a degree of compassion and support at a time of need. Um, and so uh, we are uh, really following the consultation intending to introduce uh, legislation that, that very closely really follows the, the legislation in Great Britain um, on this issue. Um, I'd now welcome any questions that the committee might have. Um, Colin, thank you very much for that, and, and you've addressed a number of the, the points that I, I did want to, to take up with you in your, in your opening statement, um, and the, it's welcome that you have given the, the um, predicted timeline in respect of the legislation as well. Um, there are some of the things that you know perhaps I would like to explore in a wee bit more detail, and maybe later down the line, once we actually have the, the bill in front of us, will, will be the um, appropriate time to do that. But in relation, one specific issue is in relation to agency workers, which wouldn't be included in terms of the proposals. Um, it would be employees only. So just in terms of the, the rights of agency workers, as is legislated for, where do these two, um, I suppose, or the provisions for those uh, kind of intersect? Kelly, do you want to come in on this one? Um, I, I, I can do, yes. Um, uh, you're, you're quite right, Chair. Um, the legislation here in this regard um, is for employees and workers, but in a different uh, way. Employees will be entitled to parental bereavement leave and pay. Um, workers will be entitled to parental bereavement pay only. 
um, uh, because they are not under an employment of contract. Um, there's no mutuality of obligation for them uh, to be in work on certain days and at certain times. Uh, they're not entitled to the leave aspect, but would be entitled to the pay aspect. Okay. Um, I suppose just could you give me a wee bit of, of clarification around the, the why of that? Mm. The, the reason is, is historic um, with regard to, to employment law. Um, it dates right back um, to the 1960s, 1970s. Um, employment law has always been drafted with employees who have employment contracts with their employers in mind. Um, so if we were to include workers and agency workers um, in this regard, uh, we would be changing um, protocol uh, with with regard to all family related payments, so it's something that we would need to consider much more uh, in much more detail, and something that we would need to look at in the round. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be prudent, or I don't think it would be uh, the right thing to do to do it for just one family related payment um, in this regard. Okay, I think that that's something we might want to look at in a wee bit more detail down the line. Um, and just uh, there's a couple of other things that um, I wanted to pick up as well. The qualification period, um, and I suppose I, I would flip it around mm. if, if it's a very small number of people, and thankfully it is likely to be a very small number of people who will find themselves in these circumstances, mm. then the provision, in my opinion, should be there as a day one right. Um, of employees to be able to access um, this, the leave and the pay. Um, I, I don't know if you have a view in respect of that. Colin, I'm happy to come in on that one yeah. if you're okay with that. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, with regard, you're, you're right, with regard to the, um, uh, thankfully and hopefully, very small number of parents who would suffer the loss of a child under the age of 18 and indeed be within the first 26 weeks of employment with their employer. We, we did look at this in, in some detail. If we were to um, not maintain parity with, with GB in this regard, uh, there would be a, a one-off fee from HMRC of £180,000. Um, so because of the very small number of parents who would actually suffer this loss and be in that qualification period, um, it's economically un un unviable um, as regards value for money of public funds to uh, recoup that £180,000. It would take 20 to 30 years of payments to, to reach that amount, which is why we went to the Department for Communities. Um, our minister was keen that we check that there were would be um, some support for the even small number of families that would find themselves in this position, and they do have a discretionary support scheme uh, that parents who find themselves in this position um, and couldn't avail of the parental bereavement pay because of the qualification period could then, um, if they met obviously the conditions within uh, the welfare uh, discretionary support scheme, could pick up support in that regard. Okay. What is that £180,000 for? It's actually because it would require HMRC to change. Uh, there are three or four different forms with regard to parental bereavement uh, leave and pay. They would have to uh, make changes to those forms on the gov.uk platform. So the, the, the £180,000 is related directly to the costs associated with that. So it's an admin fee, essentially? Yes, it, it, it would require IT, IT um, changes from HMRC. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for the explanation. Um, and just a final point for myself is, um, and I think it was raised in, in the consultation responses, was um, the the incidence of, of miscarriages being included in the um, in the entitlement to the leave and payment. Um, what was the consideration in respect of that? Um, the, the consideration in respect of that was we. Um, we're very much uh, in agreement with, with what is in currently in place in GB, and that is that um, parents who lose um, a child after 24 weeks of pregnancy will be included. Um, that, and we, we maintain the line that, uh, akin to GB um, that it wouldn't go any further than that. Okay. 
Um, okay, look, I, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a wee sec. Can I bring in Stuart, please? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and very much appreciate and very welcome this very sensitive piece of legislation. Um, I, it's important, but as you say, hopefully uh, to a very small number of people. Um, uh, we will, as the chair said, um, work, work our way through that when it, when it comes to the chamber uh, by way of legislation. But, uh, the question this morning is about what prospects I've already written the Minister in respect to this. Uh, there are, are for widening the whole issue of paid bereavement we leave for employees in, in Northern Ireland. Um, we currently Currently, the law does entitle an employer to give time off for a bereavement, but even that is not particularly clear. Um, and nowadays, fa uh, family and other relationships uh, can be much wider than just a parent or a child, and I appreciate that, that this is in, specifically in respect of, of, of a child. But um, I think there is a, there is a need uh, to look at the wider issue of bereavement leave um, in the workplace and also in relation to the fact that that, as far as I am concerned, should be for a paid period at the cost of the employer. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, if any, in your consultation, were there wider considerations given and were there indeed wider representations made beyond that of just parental bereavement leave? Well, I suppose this particular consultation exercise was fairly narrowly uh, focused on the specific proposal. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, rights to uh, leave and, and pay in, in, in a situation such as bereavement more generally, um, you know, it is a devolved competence, uh, employment law, and uh, the, the uh, executive and assembly could legislate for that. Um, if it was a statutory payment, um, the executive would have to find the, the money for any um, divergence from uh, the policy at, at uh, UK level. Um, the other issue around all of these um, situations that, uh, that employees and workers can find themselves in is that employers have quite a very of quite a range of policies in these issues, and many employers go well beyond the statutory entitlement. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. be an uncommon situation for an employer to actually give someone leave on full pay in this type of situation, or indeed in any bereavement situation. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose many of us who benefit from public sector type uh, terms mm -hmm. and conditions of employment, um, you know, don't need to worry too much. I, mean, I suppose, in in, in the sense. Um, the, the COVID-19 situation has sh shone a light on mm -hmm. those in the workforce who have lower levels of rights because you know we've had situations like statutory sick pay, which is at a lower rate than the, the rate for uh, statutory bereavement pay. It's, it's less than £100 uh, a week. It's an issue for DFC. But I mean, uh, you know, whereas there are other uh, people whose employers have policies where, you know, if they've had to take time off because of COVID, they've been able to, uh, to do so with full pay. So, I mean, I think part of the challenge here is to send out the message to employers in general that, uh, you know, if they you know, are supportive to their staff in terms of uh, the policies that they have, uh, then that will help them retain their staff. It will mean their staff have a better general uh, state of health, um, aren't suffering from stress because of worries about financial issues and so on. So, I mean, certainly, um, you know, a, a wider right to, ber to bereavement leave and pay is something that the Assembly could consider in the future. Uh, I suppose we were mindful in bringing forward this proposal in, the, in discussions with the Minister. There's a limited time available in the rest of the current mandate, so while it's practicable to bring this uh, set of, of new rights into uh, being within the current mandate, uh, to go further than that would probably uh, be uh, beyond what's possible. Okay, well, thank you for that information. That, that's been very helpful. And I think that maybe some of us will be looking to see whether or not the legislation you bring it forward may be subject to amendment to, to allow for wider scope. I, 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 I 
believe that while the vast majority of employers in Northern Ireland, and as you rightly say, the public sector have very um, um, very good schemes which deal with the very sensitive issue of bereavement and, and time off and pay for that time off. There are sadly a number of employers in Northern Ireland that, that, that will, 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 will be at, at worst minimal and indeed there are occasions when people are actually refused even time off. In those very difficult circumstances, so it is a, it's an er, it's an area that is now on the agenda, and I think going forward, it's one that we need to be starting to make improvements in. There, there have there, there is movement at Westminster on this. Uh, I know the trade union movement has been particularly active, and a number of individuals in the trade union movement are, are particularly active in taking this forward. And it also follows uh, broader international movements, uh, both in New Zealand and in Europe and France, in particular. Uh, where these issues have have now got onto the onto the legislative uh, books, uh, and I think that's an area that we need to be looking to in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stuart. Um, thanks, thanks, Chair. And uh, just a couple of points. Any, um, do you see a real need in in the public sector, David? I think Stuart, I suppose, covered it some way um, for this. You know, a lot of um, Work has gone in to the public sector in trying to have a sympathetic line management system, line managers that know their staff and know what, what is going on and, and are aware, and obviously those that are approachable. So um, having worked in, the, in the, the public sector, I think you know we are aware that, that in the main, um, there is quite a bit of sympathy to staff who have uh, problems or personal problems. But do you think there's an issue there of inconsistency, perhaps, across various departments, and that needs to be more streamlined and be seen to be more consistent? Well, um, I mean, I suppose it's not just the public sector. I mean, there are many good uh, private sector employers who uh, would take similar approaches on, on issues uh, yeah. like this. Um, I, I suppose there are particular challenges for very small businesses in, in supporting their, their staff uh, in this type of situation. Um, the, um, I mean, even you mentioned inconsistencies within the public sector. I mean, there can be inconsistencies in terms of uh, entitlements that go over and above the statutory minimum. I mean, if you look at something like uh, paternity leave, um, some employers uh, the, the statutory entitlement is to two days, I, or in fact, I think it's to, to two weeks on this £151.20 rate. That's the one that will apply to uh, parental bereavement leave. Um, some employers, like the civil service, give two days of those two weeks on full pay. Um, other employers within the public sector and some in the private sector give the full two weeks on, on full pay. I mean, those are issues, I suppose, of people's contractual entitlements. And they are within, um, uh, I suppose, the, the, the scope of employers to, to make decisions on what package of, of benefits to offer their staff. Uh, but certainly, uh, I, I suppose, a lot of the advice that comes from the HR uh, profession is that uh, employers who you know, are generous with these types of entitlement uh, hold on to their staff um, you know, longer yeah. and probably have lower rates of sick absence and so on. So under, under the, the proposed legislation, the private sector will be obliged to, to allow this leave. Is that is that the intention? Well, they'll be obliged. Yes, they'll be obliged to give the leave, but the payment, the statutory payment, will come from uh, the national insurance fund. From the national, which can, is that a recovery? But employers could, uh, employers could top top it up if they wish to. And that fund, just to clarify, how is that fund administered then? How how does the employee get that funding or get access, or is that the employer's responsibility? Well, that's administered uh, between the employer and the HM and customs. The employer? Between yes, them? I have. So the employer would claim it, would pay it to the yeah. employee and claim it yeah. back. Does the public sector, do they have entitlement to this claim back? Or do they exercise? Yes, I mean it's all. Yes, I mean it's done uh, through the administrative processes, through the relationship that every employer has with the HMRC. Do they actually do it? Do you think, or the public sector government bodies just 
accepted as as a cost, or will do they claim it back? Well, the system. I mean, the systems are in place, and the HMRC uh, operate them pretty rigorously. I mean, Kelly, do you want to come in with a bit more detail of how they do that? You've had some discussions with them. Um, yeah, I can certainly um, give you a bit more detail on on um, you know the HMRC processes and, and how employers would would can claim that back. But as regards to if the public sector actually do that, I wouldn't be in a position to answer that query for you. That would be a DOF. I would have to get some clarity on that for you. Um, what what we are doing here in this legislation is providing the statutory minimum that uh, employers out there must provide. Uh, all the good employers out there, like the public sector, who, who actually would be much more generous with their employees if they suffered the, uh, the death of a child, um, th that might be in their terms and conditions already. So they may not require the need to avail of statutory bereavement leave and pay. But knowing the public sector as I do, I think that if this came in as in law and was a statutory minimum, then yes, uh, each department would. Um, accurately reflect that in, in people's pay slips, P60s, and with HMRC, it would be recorded as such properly. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, folks. Okay, thank you. Um, and Kelly, can I just go back to the, the, the question around miscarriages? Would, that, would yes. there be provision um, under other uh, leaves and potentially payments that would provide for those who find themselves in those circumstances? For example, in, to, in relation to, to maternity leave. Um, Colin, I might I might need to take um, assistance from you on this one, or Lawrence, you might be more uh, attuned to what is currently under the law as regards maternity leave. Uh, certainly, for ourselves in employment law, um, all that I can say is that certainly. If, I assume that you're, you're talking obviously about miscarriages that happen before 24 weeks um, in, in the pregnancy and certainly um, at the moment we are not looking at um, introducing any special uh, leave entitlements or pay entitlements under the employment law framework to, to accommodate those such people. Um, I, Colin, do you know a little bit more maybe about the maternity um, regulations or is that something we need to che uh, check up with the Department for Communities? Um, well, the, the 24 weeks um, time frame, uh, as I understand it, is, is the time frame that triggers uh, maternity leave. So if a, a woman suffers a miscarriage after 24 weeks, um, she'd be entitled to maternity leave. This would be an additional entitlement in, ad in addition to that. Um, I suppose there would be a, a wide range of other um, rights that may be at the discretion of the employer uh, in terms of contractual sick pay, for example. I mean, it's fairly likely I would have thought that uh, a woman in this position would need to take sick leave. Uh, many employers have uh, sick leave policies where uh, sick leave is paid at, at full uh, rate of pay for uh, a significant period of time, potentially, um, and then may reduce to, to half pay. But those are contractual entitlements. Uh, I mean, the statutory minimum in terms of, pay, of sick pay is, is statutory sick pay, which is uh, £93, pounds, uh, something a, a week. Okay, no, no, thanks for that clarification. And as I say, there's some things that we, we may want to, to take up in more detail when the legislation comes to the committee. So, look, thank you very much for the briefing. It has been um, a useful overview in terms of... Um, an update in, on the consultation, and we look forward to the bill coming to us hopefully in May. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Look to you then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you now. Okay. So, moving on then to um, matters arising, and we're, we're running out of time. Um, so, at number six point one at page one hundred and thirty-two of your pack, there's a departmental response regarding the Argus blog and steel imports. The issue has been resolved with businesses here being sent guidance from HMRC on how purchases um, from Britain and imports from the EU and so we have a wee bit of feedback there. Maybe if members could just mute again. Um, so industry feedback so far is that this provides what's necessary for trade to continue. The steel tariffs paid in error by businesses here will be reimbursed. Um, so it's to note unless members have any comments to make. Great, thank, okay, you. thank you.
So moving on then, page 133 of your pack, there's a departmental response regarding the query from We Playhouse and support for the soft play sector. The department outlines schemes um, available to the soft play sector and the department states it cannot comment on specific questions about the eligibility or how it has been applied to individual applicants or sectors such as soft play businesses as the scheme is administered by the Department for Finance and the key eligibility criteria is associated with the requirements under the health protection regulations. So are members content to forward this correspondence on to the company? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Page 135 then of PACs, there is a departmental response regarding um, a golf professional and other sports and membership clubs. Um, most sports and other membership clubs should be available, able to avail of the LRSS. In relation to the golf professional, the department advises he's likely to be entitled to support from Part B of the CRBSS, provided he meets the eligibility criteria. As he's been self-employed, he may also be entitled to the self-employed income support scheme. Um, this response has already been shared with the correspondence, so it's just to note. So moving on then to page 137, there's correspondence from Michael Gove to the European Commission as um, Vice President Maros Shakovic um, regarding the next steps for the protocol. Um, Mr. Gove highlights the implications of the Commission's actions on the 29th of January, and he further highlights problems with the operation of the protocol, including extensions to arrangements that apply to supermarkets and their suppliers' parcels, um, medicines and chilled meat pro products, and his members will likely be aware. Um, there is a meeting scheduled tomorrow to discuss these issues, so members content to note at this stage, and I'm sure it's something we'll return to. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, page 141, then, there's a response from St Mary's um, University College regarding awarding re arrangements and admissions for 2021. The principal recommends that the final grades be agreed before they are released with no likelihood of wholesale uplift or amendment. Furthermore, in order to ensure that student number quotas are not exceeded, it's important to receive grades with all or sorry, from all examination authorities within a reasonable time frame. Um, universities, university colleges and FE colleges are liaising together on, on these issues currently and will bring proposals to the Department for consideration. So our members content to note this um, at this stage and we can return to it when we get some more information. Great. And Peter's just telling me we anticipate that um, in the next couple of weeks, so we will come back to that. Um, then at page 142, there's a response from Queen's in relation to international travel. The committee agreed last week to bring this response forward again from the 27th of January meeting, and it relates to the next item, and the issue was originally raised by Gary back um, a few weeks ago. So the response highlights procedures and processes followed by the university and its liaison with relevant authorities, as well as the rationale for students returning. Members agree the response should be shared with UCU and the following item is the UCU reaction. Um, this response has previously been noted by the committee at its uh, meeting on the 27th of January. And then page 143 is the response from re, um, UCU regarding the issues facing its members at Queen's. So just to refer that to page 41 of the table packs is a further response from UCU regarding international students um, and UCU does not accept the university's view on the need for international students to attend the university. So if members are agreed we will um, communicate with UCU and Queen's and urge them to um, try and reach some resolution on these issues. Are members yeah. content? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so moving on then to page 144, there is a letter from the UK Public Accounts Committee on the protocol and preparedness for the end of the transition period. This has been shared with the Assembly's PAC um, for the committee's information. The letter outlines overall preparations and contingency arrangements, improving trader readiness, expanding customs um, and additional costs of the, the new border requirements. So the letter is dated the twenty or sorry the first of December twenty twenty and has obviously been overtaken by events, um, and it relates to a national audit office report, which is the next item. It's not. Um, it's probably just for noting at this point, given that it is outdated. Um, unless members have any specific comments around it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
and we'll move on then to page 150 of um, your packs. There's the paper from the National Audit Office on UK border preparedness in the end of the transition period, which prompted obviously the previous correspondence. So again, it's to note at this stage, unless there's specific comments around it. Okay. Page 164 then of your packs. There's a response. Um, from the Committee on the Administration um, of Justice regarding frontier workers. Um, members will remember frontier worker permit scheme has been established to enable protected frontier workers to be, obtain a permit as confirmation of their rights under the arrangements with the EU. The scheme makes it easy for protected worker, frontier workers to obtain evidence of their right to continue coming in to the UK for work once free movement has ended. Um, the committee had asked CAJ to forward on their response from the Home Office when it was available. It um, doesn't particularly address any of the issues which had been raised by CAJ. Um, and I think one of the continuing concerns around the Frontier Workers Scheme is the lack of awareness of it. Um, I'm not sure if members have any specific um, suggestions to make in respect of this, other than to encourage awareness raising and that would be undertaken, I assume, by the Home Office, but the Department may have some role in terms of NI Business Info and communicating to businesses um, via that, those channels. Yep, Chair, we, we understand that there is a communication strategy uh, around this that is to be ramped up. Also, uh, we understand from the CAJ that they will continue to push hard for answers to their questions and for proper communication and support to be available to people who fall into these categories. Okay. Um, so then moving on to page 29 of your table papers, there is the DFE weekly sit rep. And just to remind members that this is official sensitive and is not for wider circulation. So I guess to note unless members have any specific um, comments around it, just so use, it's a very useful update we get. So moving on then, page 32 of table papers, there's a departmental response um, on BTEX. We had asked the department for clarification on what assessments can still be done and what assessment has been made um, of the risk of damage to reputation of BTEX and other qualifications undertaken during the pandemic. The current position is internal assessments for vocational qualifications should continue. If this approach changes, the awarding organisations will contact centres to advise. This group of qualifications continue to carry the same equivalence as usual, and the regulators meet stakeholder groups such as higher education providers to ensure parity and portability of qualifications. So, unless members have any particular points to make, is to note. Read. Okay. Thank you. Moving on, page 34 of table papers, there, there is a departmental response um, regarding issues faced by students due to the pandemic. Um, it contains further details of the breakdown of new funding supports for students, communication with students in relation to support available, support for students currently experiencing mental health issues, and finally, what support and plans are in place for students going to university with no A-level exam experience. Um, and members we, uh, will know we've already raised a number of issues in relation to the student um, support payments. So unless there's any other specific points on this. Great. Okay, moving on then. Page 37 of table papers, there's a departmental response on the student hardship fund. Um, the response contains clarification on the loss of funds at the end of the financial year. What support is being offered to the students experiencing financial hardship due to fulfilling tenancy agreements and the issuing of advice to students regarding um, private rented or tenancy agreements? Um, so again, it, it's to note unless members have any particular points they want to raise. Uh, Chair, can I just come in there yeah, uh, briefly? Um, I mean, I understand that the Minister doesn't have uh, the authority in relation to uh, private sector contracts for, for students, but I, I think that the, the Minister uh, could put out a, a public statement to support students uh, in relation to uh, these contracts and make an appeal to, to uh, private landlords to, to be very lenient on, on, on the students uh, and their contracts and release them, if at all possible, from these contracts. Uh, and, and nobody expected her to kind of override the contracts because uh, she can't. 
but it was uh, that uh, support that we, we were required. And I think that that's still uh, within her remit uh, to do that. Uh, it's within um, you know, uh, the, the, the job, I suppose, of, of all of us to actually ask for a, a bit uh, of common sense at this particular time um, for the landlords to, to, release to release people out of contracts uh, that they can't fulfil. Thanks, Sinead. Um, we can we can write right to the minister on that yeah. point. Um, and I suppose, Peter, if we could also seek some clarification, because the minister has referenced um, encouraging the universities to be more flexible about the um, hardship fund criteria. So perhaps if we could get some um, indication of what that means to, in respect of the universities and um, how they are, you know, making them more accessible to people, because. I know I, I'm still getting in contact by students who are finding it difficult. Chair, I actually had a, an update from universities this week, and they agree with that, that the, the funds are still underspent. Um, and they're looking at further ways to try and direct students towards them. Um, it, it's one of those processes where communication has to be phrased mm -hmm. in the right way so that people understand just exactly what they can do but I, you know everything you've said the universities have already been flagging up that there is an underspend yeah I, I think the the problem certainly that is being communicated to us as reps is that the criteria for the schemes are still making it difficult to access them I had a young fella contact me last week who told me that the university had turned him down because he put a five pound bet on a football match in November um, so that apparently makes him a, a risk of um, online gambling. So that you know, it's those type of things that are, are still being barriers to students being able to access these um, funds. And um, I think that although criteria are obviously there in, in normal years to ensure that it gets to the right people, a lot more students are obviously in, in financial difficulty at the moment. And I think that needs to be reflected in the criteria for the schemes. Sure, we'll explore that further. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right, thank you. So moving on then to page 39 of table papers, there's correspondence from the DALO regarding the Invest NI advice clinics. Businesses can book up to three 20-minute appointments with specialist advisors who are experts in their fields covering the following subject areas, transports and logistics, customs and tariffs, VAT, supply chain and strategic sourcing, EEA, worker rights and employer visa, sponsorship advice, um, sending or receiving personal data and legal advice. Um, 1,046 business representatives have attended these events with 678 one-to-one -one appointments having taken place so far. So our members can tend to note at this stage, and it's something that obviously we, we may want to return to. Great. Yeah. Chair, can I just come in here? Um, that's very, very welcome um, that those clinics are available um, for businesses. But our real difficulty at the minute is that businesses in GB are not aware of of the new rules and and, and the new trading uh, environment that they're in in relation to GBNI. Is there any way that we, as a committee, can uh, write to to UK Trade uh, and ASM to put on a similar support system to support businesses that are wishing to trade into NI? Because there's a, a real dearth of, of knowledge uh, from from the other businesses. Our businesses, believe it or not, in Northern Ireland are actually quite good uh, in, in knowing what the new lay of the land is but it's not working the other way. So we really need some way um, to, to, to tap into UKTA in order to make sure that they are supported. Businesses in UK mainland are supported uh, to, to trade into Northern Ireland. Chair, it might just be useful um, to update the committee. We, we have letters out um, on those issues to um, appropriate ministers in London. We're, we're also uh, going to be looking at that as part of our briefing with the other committees when we have TSS in front of us. So I know the minister has also um, flagged up a lot of the issues around GB uh, companies not having registered with TSS, not having registered with the other support systems so that they can uh, have, a, have a better understanding of trading GB to NI. So I think we've also uh, chair, I think around saying flag that up to FM and DFM as an executive issue. So those are all um, that's all correspondence that out that's out there. But I suppose it's it's getting the TSS people in front of the committees will will really be a, an opportunity to burrow down into that. Okay, thanks, Peter. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to um, item number eight, which is our correspondence, and come back to, to PFG next week. If members are content. Great, yeah. Okay, so um, then at page 203 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Committee for Justice to the Economy Minister regarding the accelerated passage of the damages return on investment bill. Um, so I don't know if Paul would like to comment on that as, as chair of the Justice Committee. He is free to do so. Okay. Um, okay then, so it's to note unless members have any other comments they want to make. Great. Then page 211 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Committee um, for ERA to the Department for the Economy regarding correspondence they receive from business in the community. The group is leading on a campaign business action on climate in Northern Ireland to challenge and support businesses um, to address climate change and is seeking support to gain additional funding. So it's to note unless members have any particular comments. Great. Thank Page you. 214 then, there's correspondence. Yes, thank you, Madam. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Apologies, I, I, I was frantically trying to unmute myself. <laughs> And it, it just wasn't unmuting for the previous item. Um, so that uh, I noticed that letter was included in the pack. I didn't realise that writing to executive ministers and ended up correspondence also went to their scrutiny committee. But yes, that injury duty rate is one that the Justice Committee has been dealing with for uh, a number of months. Um, and I suspect the Justice Minister will try to navigate it through the executive this week. Um, but she is trying to have accelerated passage and granted for it. Um, but the Justice Committee has outlined various reasons as to why it would be concerned about that approach. But um, yeah, that, that's that's what that relates to. So apologies that I couldn't unmute myself at the appropriate time. No, that's no problem. Thank you. Um, and, and it's useful to get that input as well. Um, so moving on then to page 214, there is cor correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office regarding the High Street Task Force. The committee had heard evidence from TEO officials on the High Street Task Force last week and raised questions regarding the use of the unspent monies intended for the High Street voucher scheme. Um, so the clerk acknowledges that this committee has engaged on this subject with the Economy Minister and asks that we forward to the Committee for the Executive Office any further developments in this area. So are members content that we forward correspondence to the TEO committee? Chair, just the, the High Street Task Force has it met. There was talk. At, there was talk in the media. At the time. I don't know exactly what the details are. Can I just ask members to mute if they're not already muted? There, I think we're we're getting a bit of home activity feedback. Um, sorry, that threw me there. <laughs> High Street, yeah, High Street Task Force. Sorry, yes, High Street Task Force. So uh, we we have pinned down some detail on that, but I'm. I'm not going to say that off the top of my head. I can remember if they've actually met now. I know they were talking about meeting yeah. and that there was a, a a lot of announcement around that, but I'm going to need to go away and check that chair. Okay. I'm just not 100% sure that that has happened yet. And we can seek an update in yeah, due course in yeah. relation to it as well. Good, thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Chair, can I get in on that briefly? Yep. Go ahead, John. Thanks, I know we're up against time here. Um, my understanding is that it hasn't met. Um, can I just get some information maybe from the clerk regarding this? That and uh, the assembly earlier uh, in the week that was muted that the task force would be sort of incorporated and rolled into the overall enforcement uh, task force around COVID. If that's the case and there's not a clear task uh, high street task force, I would be worried. And I think we'll all acknowledge the massive impacts and pressures of our high streets were under pre-COVID. And we only have to look at our independent retailers now to see the pressure they're under. I think something like um, a, a complete focus and prioritisation of our, of our high streets requires its own its own unique task force and, and group, and I would be worried if that's the direction of travel. But maybe I'm, I'm happy to be corrected if I if I misinterpret that. Chair, my understanding from the the question time, I think that, that Mr. Stewart is referring to, was that it, it's not going to be ruled into the the wider body. But what we we'll do is we we'll check back on the hand start on that, um, but. The understanding was that it was still a standalone um, group that would, would push forward with an agenda. I think, now that uh, Mr Stewart has mentioned that, I think I do recall the fact that, yes, they haven't met, um, but they do seem to be very close to being ready to do that. But let me bring back the hand sort of that from um, Monday's plenary, because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that 
First Minister did clarify that the, the group was still standalone, but we'll bring that back to committee. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. It's always nice to be referred to as Mr. Stewart. I feel very proper now. <laughs> 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 Moving on then to page 215, there is correspondence from the um, Department for Communities enclosing a copy of Invest NI's retention and disposal schedule, which has been agreed with Pony. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Great. Right. Page 284, there's correspondence from the Airport Operators Association regarding an airport recovery plan. Um, the airport recovery plan, the A. OA set out the main conclusions and outline how government support will be vital even in an optimistic scenario to prevent the UK lagging behind our international competitors. So are members content to send this on to the department for comment? Great, thank yeah. you. And then page 302, um, CBI's NI's COVID emergency working group notes from its meeting on the 3rd of February. Are members content to note at this stage? Great. And then page 304, there's correspondence from CBI to the First Ministers regarding their roadmap for reopening of the economy. They outline six key ideas that would be useful for any roadmap to cover, confirming what will be considered low, medium or high risk economic activity, <clears throat> deciding whether there will be tiering, identifying and understanding the conditions that need to be met before rolling back certain restrictions, outlining how the vaccine will be deployed once the most vulnerable groups are inoculated, thinking how regular mass rapid testing in the community and workplaces could allow a wider, speedier reopening of the economy and creating bespoke detailed plans for the harder to open sectors of the economy. Um, so if members are content to, to highlight this to the minister. Right. Chair, yep. Chair, can I come in? Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree totally with, with the, what is outlined there by uh, CBA. What I do um, know, because I've been contacted by a few businesses uh, this morning prior to committee, is that there is great concern um, with the Chief Medical Officer's um, assessment yesterday. Um, and, and, and I think that we probably, in relation to businesses and employers and employees, we need a wee bit of more clarity in and around that, um, because a, a little bit of hope uh, was taken away yesterday with the with the announcements. So I think that um, the minister needs to come in and clarify, particularly around there in, in, in deciding whether there will be tiering, etc. Is there a plan uh, to do this? Uh, in the future when we are at the point of opening up. So uh, uh, there is concern in the business community today after the CMO yesterday. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, Claire's looking to come in there as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's just to kind of get back up to Sinead's comments in relation to that. I've received quite a considerable amount of correspondence today in relation to the, the Chief Medical Officer's comments yesterday. And I appreciate this point. It's probably speculation, but I, I, I do think the business community and, and indeed the wider people of Northern Ireland need some reassurance around those comments and, you know, on what basis, what perspective, what evidence in, in which he was giving that, because there's there's quite a wider, severe impact, not just for businesses, which this committee is concerned, but I think also around mental health and and you know how far this is going to last. I appreciate that you know he's it's perhaps a cautionary comment he made. However, um, I, I I do think it will have a lasting impact and, until it's clarified. So um, I, I would certainly agree with what uh, the the deputy chair has said in and around that. Okay, thanks, Claire. John Dow is looking to come in there as well. I'm not surprised by the chief medical officer's comments for the reason of the experience. Over this last year, we have to remember that when we opened up the economy again in late summer and then in the autumn, uh, infection rates rose. When we opened up for a two-week period uh, pre-Christmas, infection rates went through the roof. Uh, and X amount of people have died in the preceding weeks as a result of uh, opening up of restrictions. We are the. The economy is suffering, there's no doubt about that. Businesses are suffering, employees are suffering. Uh, but we do know that every time we open up the economy, in the absence of a wide-scale vaccination programme, that this inf the COVID returns and returns with vigour. And we're now dealing with new strains, the Kent strain, the South African strain, which are all much more uh, 
in factories than, than the previous three years more. So I, I can understand some businesses' uh, concerns around this. I can understand the wider community's deflation as a result of, of the chief medical officer's comments. But we have to keep focus on what happens when we open up the economy. And we then have to look at ensuring we're doing everything we can to get the vaccination program, which is running well, I have to say, out to as many people as possible. Yep. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, so, are members content that we would share CVI's um, correspondence with the, the minister? Great. And, and the other issues. Yeah, and the other issues that have been reflected there. Yeah. Thank okay. You, thank you. So, moving on then, page three hundred and six, correspondence um, from an individual regarding a whistleblowing complaint about UU's decision to relocate medical courses to McGee. The committee was one of many recipients of this email, and the clerk has responded, indicating that the committee is not a competent authority with respect to dealing with whistleblowing complaints. So it's to note, unless there's any additional comments. Great. Page 308, then, the 22nd report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules 2020-21. Um, unless it's to note again, unless there's any comments. Great. Um, page 44 of Table Papers, there is correspondence from the Finance Committee regarding business support for the driving schools sector. The committee has previously written to both the DOF and DFE um, in respect of clarification as to whether either department intends to bring forward a support scheme for this sector. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Great. Okay. Page 51 of Table Papers, there is correspondence from the... Sorry, Christopher. Sorry, Christopher's looking in on the previous item, is it? I think I've just got a text there, so it might have been. If, if we bring... Let's see, it? Christopher. Christopher doesn't seem to be there. Oh, no, I think he's, he's, he may well have fallen off the main one. If um, Christopher no. comes back on, then we will we'll bring him in. Oh, no. Oh. Oh. Okay. So, page 51 of Table Papers, there is correspondence from the Communities Committee um, to the Economy Minister on Workers' Rights. And the Communities Committee is at committee stage of the Licensing and Registration of Clubs Amendment Bill. The committee requests clarification on what, if any, legislation exists to respect the rights of employees to refrain, refrain from working on days that are pertinent to an individual's religion. So it's to note at this point, unless members have any particular comments they want to make. Okay, page 53 of table papers, there's cor correspondence from the Finance Committee to the Minister for the Economy on the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Concerns were raised by savers with the Presbyterian Mutual Society in respect of reported statements from insolvency practitioners that losses to savings may not be made good. The Finance Committee has written to the Minister seeking clarification on relevant expected credit loss and capital receipts reduced requirement and in order to ascertain the current position in respect of the Presbyterian Mutual Society savers. So are members content to note at this point? Great. Good. So who's looking in? Oh, no, just sorry. Um, page 56, then, of table papers, there's correspondence from the CEO of Causeway Chamber of Commerce to the Economy Minister regarding support schemes. The Chamber availed of the first round of funding and received the £10,000 grant, but has had no further support since. Um, and they ask that the Minister considers funding for Chambers of Commerce. Um, obviously, we have had significant engagement with Chambers over the, the last um, year, and they have been a very useful source of information um, and provide support to businesses. And obviously, businesses being in financial difficulty themselves, Chambers are being impacted by that. So this is something that the committee may wish to put our, our support to in respect of asking the minister to look favourably on support for chambers. Are they talking here, Chair, Chair, is their group as a chamber rather than the businesses? Yeah. Yeah, they're talking about them, yeah, their, their own chamber. But is that not a responsibility of the councils to give support to such bodies? Can I, can I come in here, Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Well, Chambers of Commerce would receive any money at all from companies. They're very much independent businesses in their own right as well. Their funding has completely been obliterated because obviously the funding comes from the business community itself through membership, but also through putting on events and programs for the business uh, community. 
locally uh, and obviously that's gone as well. Um, I think that we would be all much more bereft uh, in, in um, the economy if we didn't have uh, chambers of commerce working locally uh, and on a business to business level and representing um, a, a, and advocating for business and their membership. So I would definitely support um, uh, the, the request by Korean Chamber. Um, as a, Chamber uh, do require additional support uh, as well because their business has completely uh, been obliterated and the community in which they serve uh, has been really adversely affected obviously by the pandemic. Okay, um, are members content then that we correspond? Chair, I would make the point that I'm very much aware that a lot of councils do support the chambers and have done for many, many years, but I also recognise the need for additional funding at this time. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on then, page 57 of table papers, there is correspondence from an individual regarding internet and technology poverty. The individual highlights the plight of broadband connectivity in a household where three siblings are undertaking online learning and highlights issues that have been discussed obviously by the committee in relation, relation to Project Stratum and digital poverty that has been highlighted by the COVID pandemic. The student indicates solutions provided by access to university facilities involve travel and contact is currently discouraged. It's likely, obviously, this is an issue being faced by a number of students, and I'm sure members have, have, been, um, have been contacted themselves by, by people in, in these situations. Um, so it, it might, I think, be worth our while highlighting this to the department and, and the university in respect of this to see if there is um, a potential solution for the student. Are members uh, content with Great, that approach? Yeah. Okay, moving on then, page 58 of table papers, there's correspondence from the Foreign from Adult Learning highlighting their rep recent report entitled Learn Well, Live Well. It deals with themes common to the feedback session of the committee's um, recent skills discussion event. Um, so the clerk has indicated that he anticipates an initial paper from that event to be available for discussion at next week's meeting. Peter, is there anything you want to say other than that? Chair, what we've done um, is from that discussion event feedback, we've gathered a number of themes around uh, skills that would be for members' consideration and then bringing those for debate in the chamber to inform the skills strategy. Okay. So are members content to note that correspondence? Great. Okay, so then any other business, um, page 119 of your table papers, there is the draft forward work program. Are members content with what is there? And uh, Peter's Great, going to tell yeah. us it's changed already. <laughs> Has, Chair, it hasn't changed already yet, but um, we, we will cross our fingers that um, it'll remain as it is. Just to remind members that next week is our short week. Um, so we have uh, a raise briefing and we have the discussion around the skills um, special uh, report and potentially look to bring back the energy inquiry report because we're, we're getting to a point now where that's likely to come to the executive and we just want to remind members what the issues and themes were that came out of that. Okay. And then we have AOB as well from, from Gordon, which is at page 143, or, or sorry, 20, 123 of your table papers. Um, Gordon, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, just quickly, uh, this corresponds from Donahue Golf Club. They've been trying to get funding. They were turned down from the Sport NI Sustainability Fund because they, they weren't showing a loss as such. They, they have, are making an argument that they should be considered under the LRSA scheme which falls under the Department of Finance. So I'd appreciate if we could write to Department of Finance to highlight this. It's obviously a lot of other clubs are in a similar position. So uh, there seems to be a loophole there that they've fallen through. So I would appreciate if we could write to Department of Finance to support the golf club, and not the golf club, but other clubs, other sports clubs that have fallen through. The, the, the initial response is, Oh, they should be getting support from the Department of Communities, but as you can see there, they haven't they've met yeah. the full criteria, so they're at the moment excluded. Uh, and because of their rates and so on, 51k, they have not been able to get grant funding. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, and uh, Peter might want to come in here. We have raised the, some of these issues, but Peter says this is slightly different. So, Chair, yeah, it, it's one we, we gathered some information um, previously around golf clubs, and, and it's one we flagged up 
um, at various points to both um, the executive office and to the minister. Um, and it does seem to be coming down, as Mr Dunn has said, it does seem to be coming down now to nuance within the scheme. But if members are content, because this is a well laid out um, set of issues, if members are content, we share that correspondence with the department and ask for a, a specific um, comment on, on what's been said there and in terms of whether um, going forward, because as we, as we know and has been said, this is a, an issue that's facing a lot of golf clubs, if going forward the department's going to put um, contingencies into place to help. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Okay, so... Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I had written to the Minister or, or tabled an Assembly question to the Minister of Finance in relation to this measure. If you recall correctly, and we can certainly look it up, he came back to me and said about the eligibility in relation to affiliate clubs. However, if it was specifically sports, then there was a fund in which they could apply, uh, apply to in respect of that. I don't know if there is a confusion um, between the two um, grants that one. Uh, organization maybe within a golf club can apply for as com um, as opposed to the golf club in itself um, but you know certainly I would support any um, correspondence or clarification that we could seek from either the Department of Finance or the Department of Economy because it seems that there's a lack of consistency and I don't know if that's just because there's a crossover of various grants so it's just to add to that thank you Good. Chair, we, we, I, I, I'm, I've noted down the points um, Ms Sugden has, has made, and that there are, I think from correspondence we've had, confusions um, between which scheme, golf clubs or clubs within golf clubs, if you understand what I mean, the, the, the shop, the bar, if it's run under separate uh, management, etc., whether they can apply to the community scheme or whether they should be applying to DFE, um, DFE schemes. So, I think it would be useful to get uh, a kind of better detail of explanation as to how that works from the department. It might also then be worth um, forwarding the same question to communities to get more specifics on just exactly how their scheme operates for the um, bars or other facilities within sports clubs who have been able to apply. So I think there is confusion, and if we can just pin down greater detail. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then item number 10 is our date, time and place of the next meeting, which will be next Wednesday morning in room 29. And just to remind members, that is our, our short meeting and we have to be finished by 12. So are members content? The meeting's adjourned. Great. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.